Gosh, Gray Waste Tim, you got a haircut, man. Looking sharp. I no. did. <laughs> Gray Waste Tim, folks, I'm happy to report is a new uncle. I think his I I don't think that's his first uncleness. I think he's 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 multiplied his uncle factor by some I'm not sure, but his brother and sister in law are new parents. So everyone Congratulations. Tim is uh that was a came a couple weeks sooner than everyone thought. So Tim thought he was gonna be here and then he had to make an emergency babysitting run to somewhere an hour away from where he lives. So yeah, there you go. So with me to my left is the mysterious Maynard James Plum Raven. There he is. Hello. Say hello, Maynard James. Hello. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, uh Longtime friend of mine and uh, the the man behind the scenes on the channel. So, a lot of the improvements you have seen and felt around here over the past year are thanks to Maynard James Plum. So thank you. Since you're on air, I'll just say it now. I do appreciate your help. It's nice to not be to not be out here alone in the world trying to hold this shit together. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. It's been a fun adventure. So uh, speaking of a fun adventure, what's that behind me? Oh my goodness, is that a YouTube? Placky thingy, it is. It means it means I'm a YouTube placky thingy member. I'm official, baby. And again, thanks to y'all. So much appreciated. Onward and upward. I'm sure we'll get. I know there are more. I don't know what the other levels are. Five hundred thousand, maybe, is your next plaque. Is that it? Or is it two fifty? I think of five hundred, and then the million, and then of course the two hundred fifty million one that we're shooting for. Uh, <laughs> That's the this only Mr. Beast has it, but uh, it I'm, is, sure, just him. I'm sure I'm sure a song of ice and fire will eventually be that popular. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, so no, we're thanks everybody for responding to uh, to your request to you know to, to hit subscribe. It really it came through. We we got a ton of subscriptions last month, and it helped push us over. And there is the reward for all that hard work. So Ben C in the ben chat re recommends a good dentist for a YouTube placky thingy. Says uh, you can get rid of that. So <laughs> thanks, uh, appreciate that, and uh, thank you all, my channel member squishers and YouTube patron or uh, my uh, Patreon patrons. And yeah, so what we are doing today, we are not going to watch the episode live. I'm sorry, the title is a little bit misleading. That would not be allowed. But what we're, we're, we just watched. We rewatched and took notes, which you can see right here. And so we are. This will serve two purposes. If you are watching this video because you just want to get caught up on the season, that this will work for that. Um, if you want to go along with us episode by episode and watch episode one and then watch this stream, then you can get real tight in on the scenes and compare your notes to ours. Either one will work. Uh, but that's what we're gonna do. Is um, you know the first time around. Uh, Maynard, if you will, uh, you know, we went live after every episode, uh, but I did not have the episodes early. So I was going live fresh with uh, Nettles and Tim and just throwing all of our thoughts and feelings right on the screen and reading the chat. It was definitely slightly overwhelming at times. So I'm really uh, enjoying or looking forward to this chance to sort of go back with a more organized fashion and really hit the main themes uh, of the episode, as well as catch a few little things that maybe we missed the first time around and didn't talk about. So shout out to everyone in the chat. I see lots of names I recognize. Menti, Jaceres, Northern Tommy. Appreciate y'all. Terra Incognita, et cetera, et cetera. Fine folks all. And uh, yeah, so real quick, let me just, we'll go through a, a, the list of scenes to sort of give you an idea, a quick idea of what we're dealing with here and what we're talking about. So the first episode, Maynard, we both kind of seem to notice, it really is, uh, the first half of the episode is really following Rhaenyra, almost like a main character, and using her story mm -hmm. as an entrance into this story. And the second half of the episode, we start to widen out and really get a glimpse of all the fault lines that would lead to war by episode 10. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's this brief, they did a good job of giving you a brief air of like hope and, and exhilaration and things are fun. And then like, it just, it starts going south pretty quick. Um, hi, Emma. Hi, how you doing? 
So yeah, they 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 come in. They say you know a hundred years of stability in the Targaryen dynasty, and then we show up the day everything is kind of starts to fall apart. So mm -hmm. you see people in this in this comfortable place, you know, where everyone's sort of like life is great. The sun is shining. We're going to be ruling forever, and our only concern is who's going to be ruling next. And that's way down the line from here. And, and then things. Uh, Things start uh, start picking up by the well. This is like you said, the second half of the episode, we start getting right into some action. But go ahead, finish with your synopsis. And by action, we mean Otto Hightower and his scheming, and also Damon's hot temperedness. But uh, and a couple of couple of scabs that won't heal. Um, there's definitely some visual symbolism going on. So one thing I noticed is uh, Tim's glamour is pretty convincing. Well, that's the thing about Maynard Plum is you never <laughs> know who he might be. Maybe that's. Maybe Tim has been Maynard Plum the whole time. Like that's you just don't know. So, <laughs> um, so ominous. The, I, one thing I really I really noticed is the the atmospheric. They hit three notes real quick at the beginning. So we start at Heron Hall, ruined castle, drafty, dark, ominous, heavy, very serious. Everyone on bated breath. So the mood and the setting matches. Very like I said, dark and like the. The crumbling castle, crumbling dynasty, like it's all right there, right? Old king. Um, and then the next shot is Rhaenyra flying with the most exhilarating theme in the story. And she's on the dragon. She's flying over the city. Um, we're immediately reminded of, well, I don't want to get into the scene. But then the third thing is she lands, and now we're in King's Landing. And King's Landing is a familiar scene to us. So we've gone from this old castle to the skies now to King's Landing. And so those three notes uh, create a context. They stretch out the, the sort of the show and tell you, here's some of the range that we have. Um, and I thought that was very effective ro rolling right out the beginning. So it's some of Ramin's best work. I mean, the, the, it's really, I mean, we're all, I guess, I think um, a lot of people complained that it was the same opening music you know not this week that once uh, episode two starts they do the the normal got theme uh but this this rainier entrance music is what i think of as the house of the dragon music like when i think of the show this is what i think of so iconic for sure it is and and it, it reminds me of john williams uh, star wars work you know it's it's iconic on that level where it's just the themes that he created for each character you know you know when darth vader is coming you know when princess leia is you know is, is on screen it's like it's that level of adding to the the feel of what you're looking at um yeah i, th I thought that was really really nice that's a good comparison it is like you hear the music and you think of the scene instantly it's it is like several pieces from star wars have that effect as well of course john williams the goat ramin ramin is the young goat he's He's looking at John Williams and going, ah, 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 and Williams is like, ah, 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 and they're, they're doing yeah. communication. So, um, and of course we in the Bay area, you know, we have our, we have goats aplenty. Got, we got the chef putting up 60. How old is he? 36. Anyway. Um, so, uh, so Rhaenyra entrance. Yeah. We're going through the scenes real quick. It's so exciting. I'm just getting right into it. So Heron Hall, Rhaenyra's entrance. Rhaenyra walks us through King's Landing. We walk into the small council scene where we sort of see Otto. We meet Maester Melos and uh, Lionel Strong. Um, and it's, it's pretty brief. It's just, you know, everything's... Oh, Corliss Valerianus. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. That was a total... That, <laughs> we just had a storm uh -oh. flicker. So the nice thing about our software, Shad, is that when the storm flickers me like that, uh, the stream stays there. So we don't have to worry about the stream crashing. They may lose us for a second. We may come in and out. So apologies, folks. There is a heavy storm in California, and my power has been flickering. Uh, so that I don't know what you guys probably just saw, maybe like a black screen for a second. Let me know what happened there, but I believe we are back. So, yeah, sorry about that. It's, uh, it's outside the storm god is trying to drown our stream oh there was a little streamception yeah 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 okay so <laughs> Rhaenyra so after the small council meeting 
where Damon is conspicuous by absence, we get the scene with Damon and Rhaenyra in the throne room. It's it's groomy and 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 kind of sexual tensiony, and we'll get into it. But it's it's what it is. It's Damon and Rhaenyra, and there there they are speaking high Valyrian. Um, and then Rhaenyra and Alicent in the Godswood. It's a very interesting scene with a lot of subtext that I picked up on. Uh, reading back over. There's a lot of interesting things to pull out of that conversation. Then we go to Viserys with the wound that won't heal on his back, which he describes as a cut from the throne. Later, we'll see him cut his hand, obviously, when he expels Damon, but introducing the theme of the wound that won't heal. Heavy symbolism again. Um, then we meet Emma in the bath. Very tender scene. Full of some, uh, some bangers. Emma's dropping some some really quippy one-liners, actually. Um, I told people after the uh, after I saw the premiere, a month before it uh, came out, it's almost two years ago now, that Emma was make a strong impact in the little time that she had. She's in like three scenes, and she comes across very strong. I, I thought. Yeah, the the candle that burns twice as bright, that but burns half as long, right? Uh, she she really. She really left a mark with her limited time on screen. Um, and, and I think sort of helped set a standard that this first episode set. The acting that you're getting is just really top notch. You know, that scene between her and Patty in the bath, it's, you know, it spoke volumes about their relationship. And we get all of this information and we only see them. They played, what, two, three scenes together in the in the whole series. But I feel like... I really understood their relationship and, and um, well, we know that's we it. The, the chat agrees a hundred percent. And um, one of the things that I love that when the acting and the dialogue is so well done, you get a sense of the different relationships between people when you see the same person in a scene with two different people. So King Viserys in the council and then King Viserys talking to his wife, completely different, just as it would be. Uh, but so well executed by the actors that, yeah, you feel Viserys take off his mask a little bit. Um, and you see his, like, in the council, he talks about, oh, I just have a feeling it's going to be a boy. But when he's with Emma, he's confessing his dream and and talking about it in much more personal terms. And then you get to see her reaction to his sort of manifest destiny vision of like having this child. And she's like, Oh, by the way, I'm the mother. I have a womb and I'm involved in this thing. And yes, it's glorious, but, but it's been rough. And a lot of dead children I've been mourning by the way. Um, so five and 10 years, you know, is a lot for someone to go through. And also when you walk around telling everyone that it's a boy for sure, they're going to be disappointed in me as the mother if it's not right, this is going to be my failure. They're not going to look at you as the King as a failure. They're going to look at me as, you know, so it's, well, she apologizes. Kind of, yeah. If I've failed you, Viserys, like your heart breaks just to hear her trying to apologize for that. It's just like, Oh God, yeah. we'll get into it. There's definitely, um, her presence in the first episode is not for shock value. It's very important to the story and it frames Rhaenyra's story, uh, really. So yeah. So that's Emma Arryn. She is from the Vale. She is half Targ, although she is an Arryn. So when he says, when she's in the bath and and he's like, oh, dragons like it hot, like she's part dragon herself, actually. And that's why she's got the very, very pale hair. So let's see. And then we go to Damon Goldcloaks. That's right. Oh, the cool fade out from the bath scene to the stomping of the gold cloaks in the, in the alleyway. Um, and that's going to lead right into the brutality and stuff. You know, um, there's Damon and my Saria afterwards. So we see, we get this Damon is introduced as this very, he, he's hitting some of these extremes, right? It's like, he's being kind of familiar with his niece in one scene. Everyone's complaining about him in the small council. Then we see he's brutal, you know, this very extreme presentation of the gold cloaks, before they back off and then start arguing, like, well, actually, he was doing his job or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then we see he's hanging out with prostitutes and, you know, cut purses and lick spittles and whatever. So he's very, you know, he's the prince of flea bottom and all that stuff. So we're seeing all that 
in the first scene. There's a lot to talk about, but keep going with the synopsis. It's so hard to do. It's so hard to do. You said this was a good idea. <laughs> I know. Though. I want to I dive in on every one of these scenes too, but <laughs> um, push and through, then we get push through. And then the tournament proper, which of course begins to get interspersed with the happy fun time birthing scene. Um, yay. And so those are cutting back and forth. That's a good 10 or 15 minutes. You guys remember that's kind of the center of the episode. You know, it is sort of like rising action drama falling. Like this is the middle. This is the very intense part. The tournament gets more violent as the childbirth gets more violent. And then we go from there to the funeral and the funeral has that second reveal of the, that the child died, right? We don't know that at first. At first, we see the boys alive, and then on the pyre, as the camera pans over, we see the second little bundle on the pyre. So that, that I thought, was effective and reminiscent of how George writes. He always reveals his horror in layers so that, like, sentence at a time, it gets worse and worse and worse. It's like, oh, yes, he killed, you know, and the winner of the battle killed the other king. By cutting off his hands before he was burned alive. After they did that to his children and wife first. And it's like, oh my God, it just gets worse as it goes. So, uh, that's yeah, a, yeah it's a, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that, but that was very, very Martin esque the way they revealed that. Yeah. I don't know if you're watching the chat. The chat is speculating about who you are. It's very entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> that was. Longtime you'll, friend and manager, Maynard James Plum. You'll notice that it's not Tim under a glamour when I when I don't bring his depth of analysis here. I, you'll 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 notice the difference. We'll miss Look, Tim soon. If you've been living in California for twenty years, like both of us have, all your friends, we've all plugged each other. Like it's that's a circle of plugs. You know, it's not <laughs> it's not even like that. Um, anyway, uh, so let's see the tournament, the birth scene, the funeral. Then we get a second small council meeting, and this is where we really get into Otto digging into Damon. Um, basically, they call this Otto calls a small council meeting, seemingly right in the wake of this funeral, to to talk about a succession crisis that no one else even thinks exists. So that's yeah. that's Otto for you. Um, definitely, that was that built his character really heavy. And following that scene, we go right to the one with Alicent and Otto, which in the layered reveal way shows you a whole nother layer of monstrous villainy of Otto Hightower, the way that he is setting up his daughter and the way the dialogue yes. is there, the way that he uses the death of his wife to manipulate his daughter. It's very sick and warped, and we will talk about it. Um, <laughs> and then we get the scene with Alicent and Viserys together, in the bedchamber, which surprises us by having this very touching moment of empathy when we were geared up for something really awful and creepy. Of course, Viserys is not thinking in that way. Um, he is, you know, mourning and in grief. And so uh, very impressive for the character of Allison to show up, having been like pushed there by her father to do something very twisted. And instead she's sort of like, actually has empathy and, and there's a real moment there. So that was a cool scene that sort of surprised us and uh, built, starts building Allison's character. Um, and then we get the, the final action, which starts with Damon's air for a day moment in the brothel, which is overlaid with auto tattling on him in the small council, very effective and e economic storytelling there. And then that splices right into Rhaenyra's coronation not coronation, but her anointing as the heir, over you know, cut in with uh, Damon mounting Caraxes and taken off, um, leaving King's Landing. So, yeah, um, there was also the throne room scene in there uh, with Damon yeah. in the series, which Damon. I think I've rolled into the air for a day section. So that's the episode, and now we'll dive into. Not we're we're not going to spend equal time on all of these scenes. Some of them are self-explanatory, but we're going to go for the ones that really, um, you know, we'll see. We'll use our discretion. But that's that's what we got to deal with here. That was the first episode, a masterful episode. Watching it back after over a year of not watching House of the Dragon, 
like I will confess, I coming into this, like I knew we needed to do the rewatch and I wanted to do it, but I was still kind of like, uh, I'd rather make another Deep Ones video, you know, really. And someone in the chat was saying the Storm God's angry that we're not doing more Deep Ones content. That's why that's, uh, but the Deep Ones are not gone. There will be more. But uh, I'm five minutes into the episode, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. This is a really good show. This is a lot to talk about here. So pretty excited about it. What was your, um, your top-of-the-line sort of feeling getting back into it after some time? You know, it's interesting. Um, there was so much expectation around the show that, especially with this first episode, I was take, you know, the first time I saw it, I was just taking in um, – you know, who the characters were, what it looked like, you know. So the seeing it this time um, and having that expectation and build up not there, I was, I was able to sort of enjoy it as a show more. I was really struck by the quality of the show, just top to bottom. You know how I am about audio. The audio quality of this show is amazing. I mean, the, the sound effects of the dragons, the just in, and the visual effects of the dragons, I was... I was struck by it really, um, but that was the first thing that hit me was the quality of the show, right? The, the, the costuming. I mean, it's just, you don't get a lot of shows, even other shows that they spend a lot of money on, they don't look this good. They don't sound this good. Um, and the writing, you know, was, was, was great. Um, this, this episode hits you a little bit with a little bit of, it's a little bit more extreme with some of the, the the gold cloaks and the birthing room and some of the things that, you know, I remember that knocked me on my heels a little bit. But now that I've seen the whole season in context, you realize this isn't going to be a shock season, a, a show full of, you know, um, some of the things that that, you know, maybe some later seasons of Game of Thrones got into that was just it felt a gratuitous. Um, and so knowing that that wasn't going to go there, I wasn't as knocked back on my heels by some of the violence that you saw in this episode. So that, that was sort of my top line, you know, take. Yeah. They, there's a real love for the material and you can, you know, we've talked about it before, but just to real quickly touch on it again, like Ryan Condal, who was writing this show solely, um, it mm -hmm. is working very closely with George Martin They've done a couple of interviews together. You could tell the rapport that they have. Um, they've been friends for a long time. George picked Ryan to do this back when it was just a seed of a pilot. He wanted Ryan to do this project like from the get-go. That was his pick. Um, and they work very closely together. You can see it's closer to A Song of Ice and Fire canon. One of my first reactions from watching it the first time at the premiere was like, this feels more like Westeros just in every sense, like book Westeros, it just does the dragon keepers, the high Valyrian. There's just a little yeah. more attention to detail as opposed to someone just going, ah, we can do whatever. It's the show. It could be different. Let's blah, blah, blah. There's a little more like, no, nah, let's make it, you know, the dragon, the, 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 um, the dragon pit should be like this. The, how do the, mm -hmm. think about it. Well, how do the, when a dragon rider gets off their dragon, do they walk the dragon to the paddock or, it's like, no, well, they hand it off to the dragon keepers. The dragons understand High Valerian. They're smart animals, so they understand commands, just like any trained animal. And so it is possible for people who haven't bonded with the dragon to use 10-foot poles, literally, to gently encourage the dragon to go back into its paddock, where it knows it will be fed. You know, this is how you train animals. But I just love all the detail of that. This is a dragon show. We should be spending time on that stuff. You know, we, we see Rhaenyra and Damon both petting their dragons and nuzzling a little bit. Like, it's that, that, that love for the dragon and the character is echoed in how we feel about the lore. And um, I think that is one of the things that fills you with so much joy watching the first episode, even though it is very extreme and violent at times as well. So, yeah, it does not feel yeah. rushed. Good call, Menti Maelstrom. They took their time. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have each character gets a nice breath to, to, to kind of come, come into this, you know, into the, into the show. They, they didn't rush it. It was, uh, it, it, it felt well paced for sure. Um, 
the the culture around the dragons, I thought they did a great job. It was it was very much part um, horse culture, you know, part the the you know. There's a lot of but but it's like this is a horse that is also an F-18 bomber, you know. Um, so it's not just like taking your dad's Ferrari out for a spin if you happen to be super rich and have, you know, that it's it's like taking your dad's tank out for a spin, you know, it's like a bit. It's it's really it's so and so yeah, so the 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 dragon keepers were sort of part part, you know, horse hot walkers and, and handlers, but then also part zookeepers you know and, the, and like the zookeepers that deal with like the gorillas and the the stuff that can kill you you know the ones that um, get eaten by tigers so. every once in a while yeah for sure um right and george right. of course does compare the dragon riding to riding a horse well that chapter we get with danny after she rides out of dasnak's pit and she's reflecting on riding on the dragon for the first time and she's like oh a horse when you whip it it turns away from the whip but a dragon turns towards the whip because it wants to kick its ass what's what's fucking with me i'm gonna get it so yeah yeah there's a lot of horse dragon comparison throughout the book so it's well it's fitting that they picked up on that and from jen super chat love your streams can't wait for the tywin roast oh yes it's still coming don't worry it's definitely coming so thank you and let's get into it. So, Ominous Heron Hall is the first scene. Uh, this was an exciting one. Again, for us book people, um, I did like the way that they did Heron Hall in A Game of Thrones, both visually and ambiance wise. Um, Arya and the Tickler, and that one weird mountain that was only there for a season that was kind of skinny but had a good beard. He was like way too good looking to be the mountain. Um, but in any case, the whole, that was creepy as hell. And uh, so they built on that here. And I really noticed um, watching it on the DV, on the 4K Blu-ray, you could like that the scene, the dark scenes look a little nicer than they do streamed on the computer. And I, I enjoyed some of the detail of Heron Hall a little more. But um, the thing, the main thing I noticed is that, and this is book accurate, but it really works for the visual storytelling. Like I said, crumbling dynasty, crumbling castle. And Heron Hall, it's a big black castle that was, it kind of is a monument to hubris. So it's not just a crumbling castle. It, like, this is a, a Prometheus, uh, Icarus kind of a, a theme here with this castle. Black Heron is somebody that was trying to rule all of Westeros as an ironborn. He cut down weirwoods. He enslaved people. He like the building of Heron Hall is like a horror show in and of itself. Mortar with blood, basically. Um, and then Aegon shows up and brings him low, you know, in one in one day. And so here we have this great council where the Targaryens are trying to preserve their dynasty. And the the setting is even if you don't really think about it, like I feel like thematically that all comes through in the scene. But the more you think about it, the more you're like, ooh. This is apt. Yeah, this this is the the, the place where uh, dynasties come to die. This is the castle where the the wave breaks and starts to retreat. Right. True. That's there's the curse of Heron Hall. Yeah, like everybody that takes over and tries to rule Heron Hall is crumbled. Yeah. So yeah, it's another layer of ominous vibes for sure. And then the the monologue. The only thing that can bring House Targaryen down is internal division. And this is true. Yeah. We see that. Like, even though you can blame Otto and the Maesters and other things, if Damon and Viserys had been tighter, then they probably would have, everything would have gone a lot different, as I just talked about in the Damon video. So that is, never, that is still true. And then the next generation, when you have the Targ Towers, Aemon and Aegon and stuff, they are Targaryens. So this is a, still a family story now where the family is, yeah. is growing apart into factions that will start a war. And this is why incest yeah. is good. Well, no, I thought, not good, I but it's why they good. did it. Nope. Go ahead. Sorry, what were you yeah. going to say? 
No, I was just going to say a fantastic way to open the, the series. Um, you know, I think, like you said, for, for those of us that have been reading these books for a long time, to see that thing happen that we had known about and read about and, and the lore and you'd heard the legends of this thing and, and to see it and to see it done so well, it was like, okay, here we go. You know, we are, we're deep in the history and we're going to see things happen that we had only heard about. And then the very next thing is, bam, there's a dragon flying. And it's like, oh, yep, here we go. More stuff we'd only heard about, you know, and we're seeing it happen. And um, so, yeah, it was, I thought that was a great opening to the show. Um, you know, the one-two punch with a little voiceover. And you start, you're like, who is that on that? Who, oh. And then you follow her in, the, you know. And So Owen, Owen in the chat is, is mentioning the poem Ozymandias in Ozymandias in, in uh, conjunction with Heron Hall. That's right on the money. That's absolutely right. Yeah, look on my mighty works and tremble. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Shout out to the Watchmen TV show. Oh my God, was that good. They made good use of that poem in, uh, in the Watchmen, since one of the characters is Ozymandias, of course. Um, anyway, so moving along. Do you, uh, well, do you want to hit this? Jenny of Old Stones has a comment that's sort of related to this dragon flying and her getting off exactly what we're talking about right now. Um, and what we were just talking about, the, the connection between the dragon and the rider. Um, if, you know, for anyone that's spent time around horses, a rider and the horse, it, it is a deep bond. And you don't fly on a horse. So just, you know, I just imagine it being a factor, you know, of a, a multiply factor even deeper with the dragon. And, and uh, so just wanted to mention that. Well, that is a great comment, actually. And thanks for spotlighting that, Maynard James Plum. Um, I'm going to now read a selection from A Dance with Dragons, which is Danny flying on Drogon for the first time. And it is same vibes. The lash was still in her hand. She flicked it against Drogon's neck and cried, higher. Her other hand clutched at his scales, her fingers scrabbling for purchase. Drogon's wide black wings beat the air. Danny could feel the heat of him between her thighs. Her heart felt as if it were about to burst. Yes, she thought, yes, now, now, do it, do it, take me, take me, fly. It was just a, just a touch of sensuality written in there. Just a, just a, a smidge, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, interesting that, that Jenny picked up on that and that, that Millie put that into her performance, you know, um, subtle, but, but, yeah. And it's consistent. Yeah, um, I mean, both of my birds are pretty horny for me, you know. I keep it platonic on my end. To be honest, I like, you know, humans, but yeah. <laughs> now I was teasing goose earlier today. He's, I was like, it's like, you want to build a nest in the drawer so we can have, we can live here and be gay parents together. Is that what you want? It's like, I, <laughs> I would want that, except for that. I don't cause goose is violent. I wouldn't want to be his lover. Anyway, you get goose one of those little buttons. Yes. Smoothly picking up mid sentence. Uh, hello. Hey, for those of you who are watching on the rewatch, we've just had a 15 minute power outage, but because my fans are awesome, they hung around and waited for me and now I'm back and Maynard Plum will be back in a minute. We have made sacrifice to the gods in the meantime and got power back. Sacramento is getting hit with a massive storm and uh, thousands of people lost power. So I'm very lucky to have power back. Be quiet, me. Me on the phone, me, there we go. Close that down. So thanks for bearing with us guys in the stream. And uh, yeah, so I'll just wait for Maynard Plum to dial back in. We were just getting into the Heron Hall scene and about to go over to Rhaenyra's entrance. What is there? Are we good? Are we back? Are we? I see dismay in the chat already. Is it? Oh. 
What's wrong? Looks good on my end. You guys can't see me? Looks like it's fine to me. Must be lying. Must be lies. <laughs> jerk guys let me know or if you could see and hear me I am unclear it looks like it's good for my end but it may be rebuffering something like that but uh, try hitting refresh try hitting live um, and then like I said Maynard Plum should be dialing in any moment Still frozen on the smolder. <laughs> the smolder. <laughs> Are we live? Can you hear me? Stutter City. Huh. A lot of lag. Well. It may be just a bit of buffering, such as we sometimes have at the beginning of the stream. You guys let me know when this is working right so I can start talking. One, two, okay, I see. David, we cannot provide you any more of our children. <laughs> uh. Just let me know when it's working again. You guys must know that I have a very much love-hate-hate relationship with technology. I really just, just trying to live my life, you know, and technology makes promises, don't usually live up to, to them. I like analog stuff. Oh, it's getting better? All right, okay. Looks like we're back in business. Cool, solid, thank you guys. Man, that's rough. So hopefully this will not go out again. And if you're on the rewatch, appreciate the patience. Mander James Plum, uh, I believe it should be the same link to get back in. But I will pay attention if you need my help. All right, so welcome back to the stream. Heron Hall is creepy. It sets the tone for the Targ dynasty. You know. Crumbling and being consumed by Dragonfire, too. We might even consider that. Heron Hall is a castle consumed in Dragonfire and House Targaryen on the way to being consumed by Dragonfire. So, yeah, now, now we're cranking. Okay, everyone's back. Can you feel the love tonight? This will maybe be a good time to share with you that uh, we got a new t-shirt. We have a new t-shirt for sale. We have a store. I'll just show this to you real quick, guys. Oh, Maynard James Plum trying to get through. It says waiting for host. Okay, let me, uh, just send Maynard Plum an email here with the link. But yes, we've got reading Rhaegar shirts, as you can see. Oh, oh, there's Maynard James Plum. Boom. And I'll just add him to the right. Hey, how's it going? 
Say something. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can okay. you hear me? I can. Beautiful. We're in. We're back. It's smooth. Like like we were never disrupted. Just picking wow. right up where we left off. Smooth as can be. Just exactly <clears throat> perfect. More Deep Ones videos, I guess. Storm God, not a beast <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, I was just showing everybody these lovely reading Rhaegar shirts. Uh, these are wow. designed by our very own Rai Rai from the chat. And as soon as, oh yeah, the internet is slow. It is slow. Let me show you some of these colors that we got. Look at this. Look at that. Who doesn't want to wear that? That is popping. And we've got ice blue, espresso. I think I'm going to get this one right here. And of course, Purple Rush. Uh, now that is, that t-shirt has some pride to it, I will say. I'd, I'd be proud to wear that shirt. And let's see what else we got here. We got some different colors. That's a cool thing. See the different, different ones, I got different colors. Get a deep heather teal, oh, see that's strong. Heather forest, that's also strong. This is the rainbow heart, folks. So thanks to Rai Rai in the chat i don't know if she's here now but she usually is so very cool and you can get that bonfire.com well it doesn't matter the link is now right below the video so just click on that and uh that'll get you there right so, don't have to just keep it simple wow well, thanks to the people that have submitted some designs they look great we look forward to rolling out some more of the ones we've already got we're super happy with and we've got a couple more coming down the pipe that we're really excited about so um one somebody's complaining about a strange noise i don't know uh let me know if anybody else hears that i don't know can't imagine what that would be so all right uh ominous heron hall we pretty much covered that uh i was just noticing heron hall also a castle destroyed by dragon fire consumed in dragon fire and Black Heron's line was extinguished, even. So, very ominous for the Targaryen dynasty heading into a war where many of them will be consumed by Dragonfire. Very loud noises. Yeah, refresh. What? I don't... There was a bad sound when he first joined. <laughs> the noise of destruction. There was a weird sound on my end when I first joined, too. Hopefully... Oh, some people are a couple now. minutes behind. Yeah, just... Uh, drag the slider over or click the live button. I forget. Or just refresh. However you do that. But yeah. <sighs> Smooth as silk. Very professional. Okay. We're doing our best. <laughs> so, oh, I, we were just talking about incest. That's, that's where we left off. I was saying this is why you have to do incest when you're a medieval dynasty. Is to monopolize the power. The Targaryens married mm. outside the family. Now other people can ride dragons, and now you have a dragon rider civil war. And in all seriousness, obviously we don't endorse incest, but in what George is, um, he's modeling the Targaryen incest on medieval incest. And medieval dynastic incest was done to monopolize wealth and power specifically. Like you married your cousin, so you didn't have to give away part of your family wealth to some other family. Keep it in the family. So the Targaryen dragon monopoly is just a fantasy world personification of that very real dynamic. Um, and you can see that right from the beginning uh, with just, you know, the marriages and you see the high towers lurking and all that. So we insist, no incest. So, and, uh, so, so we... I was just going to say, so, so we, we, we fly in over King's Landing. We get the feeling of we're back in King's Landing, but 
obviously we're in a different time. The dragons fly over, the small folk barely even look up because it's such a common thing that just dragons fly around. And then uh, we, we, get the, we get the scene in the dragon pit and, uh, and then we continue to follow Rhaenyra um, as she goes and introduces us to a couple more characters. I think next is, uh, next is her mom, right? Yeah. So she's right. Well, there's first she's meets Allison, I guess when she hops off the dragon and then she goes straight to Emma's bedside. So yeah, let's, let's hit the Allison stuff real quick. Um, which is a lot of, it's pretty, it's just a very obvious contrast. Allison gets out of a carriage. Rhaenyra hops off a dragon. And Rhaenyra's like, you want to ride the dragon? And she's like, nah, I'm good. So it's contrasting yeah. the different seats. And the way that I express it is that Allison's her seat is comfortable, but also kept. So it's kind of cage-like. And the carriage is cage-like. Um, Rhaenyra has this empowering freedom on the dragon, but it's a dangerous seat. And that's what they talk about when she lands. The King's Guards, oh, every time that golden beast brings you back safely. I'm thankful. And the Rene, you know, both of her parents are chiding yeah. her about riding. Emma's like, don't ride when I'm in this condition. Cause it, you know, she has to stress every time she rides the dragon, Emma's worried. And that's not something you think mm-hmm. about with the Targaryen dynasty. You're like, Oh, they ride dragons. They're, they're Targaryens. But it's like on some level, no, it's a mother whose teenager is riding the dragon and it's kind of like when your right. teenager drives for the first time. It's like you're nervous. You're worried about it. So Yes. Mm-hmm. Very human moment there. Yeah. And so it's yeah. Big, uh, as well. Go ahead, sorry. I was I was thinking about um, the friendship between these two girls. And, you know, of course they're going to be friends. They're of a like age. They both live in King's Landing. But at the same time, don't you think Otto completely like set the stage so his daughter had no other choice than to be best friends with this princess? So, you know, the the keptness, it's like it's I don't know. I she she's on the one hand, yes, there's a natural friendship there, but they're so they're so different in so many ways. And yet um I, I just feel like she's kind of being told, like, you know. This is your place. Go be for go be her friend. Well, so this is the mystery about Allison is that so many of her responses, most of them are calculated responses that she has to give because of her situation. And it leaves you wondering who the real person is. And there are only these little moments when the actual character pokes through. Uh, You think of Sansa talking about how her courtesy is her armor. Alicent is kind of like Sansa, but five years along and not abused by Joffrey. Uh, but with that same concept of using her cur- lady's courtesy as an armor. And also just being a political pawn in the middle of a situation and having to grow up and learn how to defend yourself uh, in the limited way that you can. And so much of the contrast about Rhaenyra and Alicent will be about agency. Obviously, this is a very patriarchal world. they are women who have a certain amount of power, but they're constantly being put in check by the men around them, and they respond to that in different ways. That's a major part of the story. I don't have to tell you that. So that starts right from the beginning uh, with the carriage versus the dragon seat, and I thought that was good visual storytelling. So let's see here. Yeah, I, I good job pointing out, yeah, the citizens... They're like, ho-hum. Yeah, it's a dragon. We see that all the time. And as, of course, the last time we saw citizens looking up at a dragon, it was Danny and the bad Game of Thrones ending and everyone's terrified because of the bad writing. I mean, because of the crazy Khaleesi in the sky unleashing dragon fire. Yeah. Anyways. Raining down fire. Yeah. So, because um, that's what you do when you win a battle is you burn the citizens that you want to rule uh, just to sort of make a point, I guess, or something. Um Anyway, so yeah, we pretty much hit the whole thing there. Okay, so then, yeah, we go into the meeting with Emma. And I noticed that Rhaenyra's parents kind of represent the two sides of Rhaenyra. Because she is 
So like, for example, we see her uh, first with Emma and Emma's talking about how, oh, well, you're going to have to have kids soon. And the, the, the child bed is our battlefield, right? And she's like, oh, well, I'd rather ride the dragon and be a knight and this and that. And it's like, well, so we're reminded of Arya a little bit. But we know that Emma is right. Like, as a royal queen and princess, like, the womb is owned by the state, kind of, like we said. And so this is one part of Rhaenyra's life. And in fact, we know by now, Rhaenyra does go on to have many children. So she absolutely is a mother. And Cyrax is a, is a dragon that lays eggs. So this is a, a mother dragon as well. But on the other hand, we see her then go right into the small council meeting and play politics, and she sees her father, the king, and Rhaenyra will become queen and run her own small council meetings as well. So we see these both sides of Rhaenyra's future being accurately foreshadowed in these two scenes. There's also a third side to Rhaenyra, and that comes in the very next scene when she meets with Daemon, because there is a Daemon side to Rhaenyra that we don't see with Viserys or Emma. So these are basically... These three adults in her constellation of family members represent the three major aspects of her personality. Uh, she also has that raw connection to the dragons that Damon does. And she has some of that fire, impetuousness, impulsivity, decisiveness at times, courage, steel. It's, a whole, it's kind of a mixed bag of stuff, but she definitely has some of that too. So what do you think of that analysis? Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's. I think that's great. It, interesting that you picked that up. I think that they do a lot of things in this show structurally to to um, to sort of highlight uh, sort of the um, the thematically and, and and symbolically what's going on. They they do a lot of tying together by juxtaposition, um, and that that's an interesting sort of the three faces of, of, of her character. Um, that's interesting. I was thinking about the fact that she was made cupbearer um, to the king. So they, they were trying to give her the kind of education that you would give to someone that you would expect to do something to have power, you know, so, and, and, um, she wasn't really taking it seriously because she was like, well, I'm not a boy, so I'm not going to be king. So, you know, why should I really pay it? You know what I mean? She kind of had this lack of seriousness at that point um, about her duties as cupbearer. And, and um, uh, that, that's just something that I noticed that as she moved from her relationship with her mom to her relationship with her dad. Um, but... Yeah, so, nothing like looking your teenage daughter in the eye and saying, you know, you're going to have to have kids soon. Like, okay. Uh, yeah, that kind of gives you a glimpse of how different this world is. It's not the way that most people would speak to their children in modern times outside of some very strange little corners of the world. Uh, I was thinking of America specifically, but let's not get into that. Um, so <laughs> uh, to your point with the cupbearer thing, so Rhaenyra has this thing. I saw the lights flicker again. Oh, God. Um, when she's with Alicent in the next scene and they're in the God's Wood, she again appears to not be taking it seriously, but actually knows her stuff. Remember, like at the end, she's, yes. she spits it all out. She's like, yeah, I, I know what it is. So we should assume it's right. probably the same with the cupbearer thing. Like, on one hand, yeah, she kind of doesn't take it seriously, but she probably is paying attention and she does have a good Great political point. mind for this stuff as well. So yeah, that is right. kind of the, the uh, con that is what you see with teenagers. And also like as an ADHD person that went through school and was labeled as gifted kind of at times, but also had trouble like, you know, if I wasn't really totally engaged, I might seem like I was not you know, engaged. Uh, so yeah, a little bit of that with Rhaenyra. It's like, eh, the small council meeting is tedious and boring, uh, but I am smart and I can get it if I want to. A little bit of that. Right. She's she's absorbing it like a sponge. She's just got that veneer of teenagerness over it. Like, I, I, I don't care, but. And uh, let's see. Well, that small council meeting, we get to meet some characters 
And we, they really, in very economical way, uh, show us who these characters are and how they interact with each other. From the, you know, you come into the scene and the, and the king is in the middle of telling a joke, right? And then a couple of people try to bring up serious stuff, the triarchy and the this and the, and then the king is kind of like, uh, what? And then Otto is like, wouldn't you rather talk about the tournament, your highness? He's like, yes, I would. Let's talk about the tourney, you know? <laughs> It's uh, it just there's so much going on there. There's there's you know, it shows that there's people around him that are concerned about serious problems in the realm. And Otto is there scheming to manipulate all of this to his benefit um, and, and put himself in between anything that's going on and the king. Right. It's like right in the middle. There's Otto. Uh, somebody's asking, what is a yoke? Ten dragons under our yoke. Would you? You were raised on a farm, Shad. Uh, would you like to explain <laughs> what a yoke is? I was not raised. On, I was not raised on a farm, but but I do. I have spent time on farms. Um, I yoke, thought all. I thought your is, home state is all a farm. The whole thing. It is. It is the whole thing. It's just corn from one end to the other. No. Um, <laughs> a yoke is the the piece of equipment that you would attach. Um, uh, uh, beasts of burden to uh, so it's like a piece of wood that you would attach a couple of uh, oxen to to pull your um, uh, uh, plow back in the old days so um, to, to so use things that were under your yoke are things that beasts that are under your control the idea that the dragons are under our yoke is an illusion <laughs> that's what Sarius would right. say there you go Cool. So there it is. A yoke is t is typically carried by yokels. <laughs> I don't know if that <laughs> checks out. This is true. That's oh, it does facts. check out. Some focal like Cletus, a slack jawed yokel. All right. Um. So <laughs> I don't know what the beginning of that lyric is, but that's what I remember. So uh, the small council meeting. Yes, it's kind of like a writing class. How to efficiently introduce like five characters. Um. Everyone's doing archetypal things. That's how I wrote it. So Viserys yes. is cracking a joke. Um, Corliss is raising political concerns that are also economic and affect him economically, right? Like, at first you're like, oh, he's the serious guy raising the real concern. Why isn't everyone taking him seriously? It's like, well, because it affects Corliss a lot more than anyone else in that room, to be honest. So that right. will be true of his interest in things going forward as well. And he's also, you can tell he's a little uneasy about being on the outside of power. And Otto is right there to make sure that he is on the outside of power and knows it. Um, so you can see that yeah. little dynamic going on. You can see Otto managing the series. You know, oh, we'll not talk about this. Let's talk about the tourney. You know, and oh, he's happy. Mm -hmm. um, throwing Damon under the bus. That starts here and gets much worse later. You can see the yeah. maester working with Otto to manage the series. That also is more obvious later. Um, the Maester is reading Moon Charts. Shout out Moon Charts. We also got a shout out to Bloodstone Island early on. Uh, Corliss talking about the Crab Feeder. So lots of good mm. A Song of Ice and Fire lore being referenced right at the beginning. And then, of course, Rhaenyra accused of being late. But what was she doing? She, I wrote that she was tending to family, uh, both Cyrax and her mother. And that's why she was late. So you could say, oh, she's not being serious or whatever. But she's doing something important. She's tending to family. And you can tell also that she seems to be a little bit overlooked by Viserys. Like, he chides her for being late. He's all like, oh, the cups, you know, are empty. Yeah. Not like you're going to miss the lesson. The yeah. 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 So the throne room Again, scene... He's focused on the important things at the small council. Like, where's who's going to pour the wine? You know. Yeah, it's very. Um, they're eating cake, and that that sets the stage for the fall, of course. So it makes you feel it's very ominous by its um, whistling by the graveyard kind of vibes. So the the throne room scene with Damon and Rhaenyra, um, it's kind of is what it is. Uh. You know, there's a couple obvious things to say about it. Like, you can see that they're united by Valerian stuff. They're speaking high Valerian. 
Damon gives her the locket. And she's like, oh, it's Valerian Steel, just like Dark Sister. So they both have Valerian Steel. This is not very, mm-hmm. you know, it's right there on the surface. Um, they're playing with the idea of Damon sitting on the throne to set up Otto's comments about Damon's ambition. But it's, you can quickly tell that um, Viserys is correct, is that Damon doesn't actually want the throne. This is all about his standing with the family. And I talked about that in the Damon video, so I don't need to belabor the point. Um, Tim, for those of you joining late, just became an uncle. His uh, brother and sister-in-law are new parents, and he was called into duty unexpectedly, and so he is not here. But we can all be happy that uh, there is a new Tim family member in the world, safely born. Another Kraken is among us. So there's that. Where is Tim? Probably reading H.P. Lovecraft to his new nephew. Yeah, I'm sure that's what's happening. Let's give him a little bit of credit. Probably not. He's attending the tourney, the, the, the tourney that's happening in honor of the birth. Uh, no, 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 no tourney. Bad tourney birth. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's the throne room scene. Uh, the Rhaenyra Allison Godswood scene I want to talk about more. So, first of all, watching this back, you could definitely see why people picked up on the, um, the vibes here. The more than friends vibes. They're... they're is a lot of intimacy. I will just say that. I will leave it to people to read in what they want to read in, but they are very intimate friends. They know each other very well. Alicent is picking up on subtle changes in her mood and interpreting that correctly um, and speculating about what Alicent is feeling uh, or what Rhaenyra is feeling. Alicent is correct that Rhaenyra is insecure and she refers to it as being, you know, you're worried about being overshadowed by your new baby brother, by baby Balin. Um, but it, this again it reminds me more of Damon's insecurity. It's not that Rhaenyra is caught up in whether she's the heir or not. She feels unappreciated and underutilized, overlooked. And that's the same thing that Damon feels from Viserys. So similar mm-hmm. emotion, I noticed. Yeah. And that later we see how much it means to Rhaenyra to be relied upon when she is made the heir. It's less about being the heir and, and more about my dad thinks I'm important and wants to rely on me and thinks I can do it. Like, that means a lot, being right? especially yeah, after Emma's dad. Right? What's that? Not feeling invisible. Being seen, just being seen by her yeah. parents, you know? That's, that's it. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, uh, go ahead. Interesting, interesting point that you made. Uh, about uh, Allison and her, the way that she was able to pick up on the the subtle nuance of her friend's mood. Um, That's the kind of skill you would develop if you were being manipulated by your parents and everyone around you since, since a very young age, you would, you would be very good at reading people. And, uh, and so I just, I thought that was interesting that you pointed out how she wasn't, she wasn't, um, she saw right through her friend, right to the core. She saw exactly what was going on. A very, very, very interesting observation there. Sorry, I was muted. I was just saying, I, uh, I didn't even think about that. You're so right. They do a good job of subtly portraying Allison's abuse. It is not obvious. It's, it's the most obvious in the scene when her father is like, yeah, go to the king in his chambers. Yep, wear yeah. one of your mom's dresses. Um, that's a little obvious, but yeah, like the the fingernails, the way that her responses are so, you know, calculated and pleasant, and you know, courtesy as an armor. Um, you're totally right. People, that's a great call. Yeah, her perceptiveness, like she doesn't have a choice. She has to. She has to read people's emotions. Yeah. Wow. Gosh. This is, yeah, if you watch this show and don't have some sympathy for Allison, I have a hard time. Like, I don't know. I, I think she's a very sympathetic character. And I think they do a good job. You're of, right. We, well, we, we don't see the abuse so much on stage, but we see the effects, the outcome, it's, its manifestation in her. And so if you're paying attention, 
you can see an abused person right in front of you, you know, it's, uh, but, uh, but yeah. And then that, and then that scene with her dad and the, and the, you know, sending her off to the King is kind of like the shark's fin of the abuse. Like you see it right there. It's like, Oh, there it is. You know, there's the culprit. That is a perfect metaphor, Maynard James Plum. That is a sh the shark fin popping up. You're, that is exactly what that scene is. It's very sharky, very sharky. Yeah. Um, so just to it, like, look, we don't deal with this on this channel too much, but out in a place called social media, which I'm sure everyone visits sometimes, there are the, the hot dragon fandom debates and uh, the media illiteracy and things that, that we hear about and uh, the stand wars. And there are certain people, I'll put it like this, the Rhaenyra fans and stands are mad that Allison is made more sympathetic at times than the fire and blood account, even though we should expect the fire and blood account to be very sexist since it's written by the Maesters. And the same thing on the other side, um, the team green fans will complain that, Oh, Allison or Rhaenyra gets main character treatment and she's, she's more noble than she is in the books. And it's like, look, everybody in this story, is going to do some pretty dark stuff by the end. As, as, a, as a writer, going in to adapt this story, the major challenge with it is that everyone acts so awful and that it is mostly a story of bad people doing bad things to each other and it gets worse and worse until most of those people are dead. Okay, so how do you make that interesting? You've got to humanize the characters at the beginning. You've got to make them more sympathetic to start with. And... If you read Fire and Blood like a smart person, let me just moderate my tone a little bit, you should be able to read into the books and understand that some of this is happening, that these characters, A, probably started off like innocent children at one point and gradually became all twisted, and that B, the Fire and Blood account is a summary account that doesn't give us the mitigating nuances at times. So I will just say that they've done a good yeah. job, I thought, at uh, making characters like Allison and Rhaenyra and even Viserys more sympathetic than they come across in the books, um, at least at first. And that, you know, there's plenty of time for them to do bad stuff. Well, and we're, we're in the show, we are looking at history happening. Fire and blood is history written. History is written by the victors. And so there's one perspective in the history book. But when you're watching something happen, we get to see all these different characters. And I think that except for a few notable exceptions, there are people that I think kind of rise to the level of monster in our own world history. Uh, but those are exceptions. Most of the time, the horrific things that happen in history are done by human beings that have multiple facets to their personality and character and are more than just this one thing that they're known for. Um, and so I just think it's the two different perspectives. And so, of course, we should get more humanization and, and empathy for these characters through this show than we did from the history book, I, I think, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and, you know, I did an Allison video before season one where I read very slowly with fire, and this is what I always say about fire and blood. If you read it fast, it's just this wash of details. But if you slow down and think about what each character would be going through in the circumstance, you can start to really fill in the blanks. And in the books, history is slightly different. Allison is older. And so what happens is the old king, Jaehaerys, whom we see at in the first scene at Harrenhal, his wife, good queen Alysanne, pretty much the greatest... Targaryen queen that ever she's on the Rushmore with Danny and like Visenya and Rainey's, you know what I mean? Like Alisanne, right? She died about four years prior. And so the last four or five years of Jaehaerys life, he got very lonely. Um, his Septon Barth died. His wife died. His sons, Aemon and Balin both died within eight years of each other. In the last few years of his life, he was very alone. Otto Hightower became his hand. And Alicent was 14 at the time. Otto Hightower put his 14-year-old daughter 
in front of Jaharis. And it says that she was reading to Jaharis, and then it throws in, oh, but also bathing him and helping him change and stuff. So, oh, oh all of a sudden she's like handmade. And so we're left to wonder, did old King Jaharis molest or kind of coerce rape a 14-year-old girl? Quite possibly. And even if he didn't, Otto intended for that to happen. Yeah, that okay. was put that was put in play by her. Yeah, by Otto. So once you catch and yeah. pick up on that, you have that's where Allison's story begins. And so you have to put yourself in that situation as a 14-year-old girl trying to navigate that. And she rolls right from there to being shoved in front of Viserys as he as right after Emma dies in short succession. She's like 19, I think, when she marries Viserys. So in the books, they aged Allison up or down a bit so that she could be friends with Rhaenyra. Um, and then they moved the, the sort of pushing her in front of the king thing to Viserys instead of Jaehaerys. But it essentially is the same character where her story begins with her father, yeah, Sleazeball, I mean, look, all of these high lords are using their children in the Game of Thrones, okay? Corlys and Rhaenys are trying to marry their 12-year-old daughter to Viserys later in the season. Little Cute little Lena, okay? That's less creepy because it's, it's open. Like, the king is single and they're trying to arrange a marriage and one presumes Viserys is not... They're going to wait until she's 16 or something before they consummate them. But it's all very gross, okay? And we're supposed to feel gross. Yeah. The way they shot the camera angle when Viserys and Lena are walking in the garden, they're showing you the height difference. Like, this is weird. This is We all yeah. know that medieval life was like this with the arranged marriages because these children are political pawns, just like Emma's womb is a property of the state. So are the children. So we shouldn't get too lost condemning Otto and we forget that like all these high lords are doing this with their children. But this is definitely the most gross and creepy version of it. What we see with Allison and Otto. So, um, yeah, it just before, yeah. before we, uh, before we move out of the, the, uh, Godswood scene, there was a line in there that I wanted to call out because it, it almost seems like it could be a t-shirt someday. Uh, She's talking about, you know, fuck the septa. Was talking about what she'd rather do. <laughs> no, I never jest about cake. Oh, <laughs> uh, when she, you know, when she's when she's like, I want to fly all over the world on my dragon with you and eat nothing but cake. And she's like, oh, be serious. She's just, I never jest about cake. I just thought, yeah, I, I get that. I get that. I feel you. I don't jest about cake either. I'm serious. True. Yeah. No, you are a baker. You, you are a baker of confections. You do not <laughs> joke. No, when you say that you bake something, it's serious business. That's it's true. Um, I actually had one more thing about this scene. So this, and this was, I was proud of this insight. So get ready. Get ready for this. Um, Allison is trying to tutor Rhaenyra in the scene, right? She's quizzing her on the history and stuff. And it comes across as like Allison knows this well and she's quizzing Rhaenyra who may or may not know it. She turns out to know it. It's about, they're talking about Nymeria, of course, who is a female character that rose to power in Westeros. So very poignant lesson, of course. But here's, here's what I noticed. Allison is trying to tutor Rhaenyra, but Rhaenyra is actually trying to teach Allison something about power in that scene. She does it a couple different ways. She rips the page out of the book and she's like, Rhaenyra. And she says, um, so you remember. So it's like, I, I picked that uh, up. And, and so, I, yeah, I'm curious what you, well, yeah, so, so it's like, so, so then, you remember it, not just that I know my shit, but just that remember that I can tear the page out of the book if I want to. And then when she says, but what if the septa, she says, fuck the septa. So she's kind of telling her like, yeah, this is how you survive in this world. You have to be willing to, to do that sometimes or else you're just going to get doormatted. Um, so I feel like there's a little bit of Rhaenyra showing Allison something in that scene. I think I, you're spot on. And, it, and I just, it triggered something. Um, so at the beginning of that scene, 
She said, well, who did she marry? She said, some man. She said, well, if you answer as some man, so-and-so is going to be mad. She said, oh, she's cute when she's mad. You know, again, it's just like, you know, she's like just teaching her right there. Again, echoing the same thing that you pointed out. Like, there's a hierarchy here. My dad is king. And, and of course, when we talk about Alison Frenera and the different ways they navigate being a woman in Westeros, always have to point out Rhaenyra has a dragon. And we know not only does that literally give you independence and power, because every dragon lord is a lord. They are a god king. They have power no one else has. Damon can defy the king. Everyone's always worried about it because he has a dragon. Okay? So Rhaenyra has a dragon. Right. Also, having the dragon bond gives you, like, gumption and steel. Like, um, some of the weak Targaryens... When they bond with their dragon, they get a little stronger, like Aenys, for example. Um, so, you know, we, we should remember that when we compare Alicent and Rhaenyra. One of them has a dragon, one of them does it. Um, but that puts Rhaenyra in a position to understand power in a different way, which I, I said that's the Damon lesson, which is kind of like the Cersei lesson, too. Like, power is power, you know? <laughs> yes. So... <clears throat> Yeah. Great scene. That was that that is a great scene. Um Yes, it's good. I had to stop and pause and rewind several times to like take all the notes during that one. Um also it's in the Godswood. So Rhaenyra is saying, you know, F the Septa and being so casual, like it's almost like they're in a church too. So it, it adds to that feel. Yeah. Then, we, then we go to Viserys being treated, which is basically all visual symbolism and thematic stuff. You know, it's a throne wound. So the symbolism of the Iron Throne, of course, it's a, thr it's a throne made of swords. It's, you're not supposed to sit easy on it. It cuts you. So this is a metaphor for the danger of wielding supreme executive power. Everyone's always gunning for you. It's, you can't rest easy, et cetera, et cetera. And then they talk about um, leeching versus cauterization, how to treat the wound. And this seems very yeah. thematic, okay? There are leeches and rats all around Viserys, sucking on him, Ooh. trying to bite and feed on him. We see the rats everywhere, the leeches, the maesters are leeching him. Like, literally, it's not even, there's no lair there. The maesters uh, are the leeches the and rats, okay? They're working with Otto right in the scene. Um, and then we think about cauterization. That's like, we'll burn it. It's painful, but it's decisive. This is what Viserys has trouble with in real life. Here in the scene, he's like, go ahead, do it. Cauterize it. If he had done more of that politically, things would have been better. He basically ignored the succession crisis right up to his death and didn't want to deal with it. Didn't deal with the fact that Rhaenyra's kids weren't legit. Go ahead. But interestingly, he wasn't decisive. He was telling the maester, tell me what to do. And when the maester said, oh, yes, do this. Then he's like, fine, then do that. He doesn't want to decide. He still isn't deciding. True. He's like letting the people around him tell him. <clears throat> and the maesters, the, that maester, the one that he reminds me of Walter Matthau, if that tells you. I mean, I'm, I'm old. That's an old reference. But Walter Matthau, old actor. He's just, he kind of plays that kind of character. That maester, when the young maester says, maybe we should try cauterization, and the old maester's like, remember, cauterization would be a good course of, you know. It's like, if that guy is just, he encapsulates everything that drives me crazy about the maesters. He was, he's so perfectly. It's like, he, he's, he's not, he doesn't know anything. He's not doing anything. He's just there you know, pretending to be important. It's, it's just, oh my gosh, that guy, he killed me. But he's Didn't great, yeah. A quarter yeah. would be a wise choice, right? It's like, yeah, his, yeah. they really nailed the actor. <laughs> I mean, you wonder well, if he's the, like the that in real thing. life. Like, he's that, that guy is just so grand maester, it's not even funny. Gray Waste Tim. Hey, look, we have, a, we have an yeah. announcement. Squish your member for 27 months. Let's, let's loyal. So, uh, Merrick John arrived today around noon. Can't post pics yet of him on social media, but he has big blue eyes like blue stars. 
Congratulations, uh, Tim. Thanks for saying congratulations, hi. Congratulations, Tim. Congratulations, man. Tim is well loved around here. That is for sure. So we are happy for you, buddy. Yeah, that's that's great news. So yeah, uh, lots of symbolism there. The wound won't heal. He's going to cut himself again. We, you know, don't have to spell yes. out what this means. <laughs> So then we go to Emma in the bath. Like we said, this is a very powerful scene. Some of the zingers here. After this miserable pregnancy, I wouldn't be surprised if I hatch an actual dragon. And of course, oh, Viserys says, and he will be loved and cherished, which is kind of funny. But of course, Rhaenyra does have a lizard baby in episode 10. It's hard to tell. It's not an obvious lizard baby, but they published some photos of the prop baby after the episode, and then it's more obvious that it is scaled. And in the books, it's straight lizard baby status. So, yeah. obviously, and we got the murals in the background of the dragon sex. So they're really just reminding you that these are alien people. There's something weird about them. They're reptilian. They're dragon people. It's, yeah. You know, no doubt about it. That almost every line that she, that the queen has in that bath scene is laden with foreshadowing of some kind or another. She says, you know, she talks about how, she's, oh, I, you know, five, five dead babies in 10 years. And she says, this is the last time. And when I heard that line, it's like, oh, how foreshadowing, you know, it's like, yeah, it is, you know, and, and it just, there's a lot of foreshadowing in that, in that scene. And, and the, um, she the says, I can't mourn a sixth. And it's like, no, she didn't get to mourn it. It did die, but she wasn't even around to mourn it. So, yeah, it's a lot of poetic yeah. irony there. Um, her best line in the scene, you do understand that nothing will cause the babe to grow a cock if it does not already possess one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, I, I don't have to explain this to you, right? And then she also <laughs> refers to um, attorney to celebrate the firstborn son that we do not currently have. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you can feel like that is, it's funny at first. And then it's really sad because you're like, so much is riding on Emma, like so much pressure, the entire kingdom waiting for her. There's a tourney outside. It's like, come on, we need this kid. It's like, well, she's like, yeah, well, it does take a minute, you know? Yeah. Now we process. need this kid. We need this boy. We need this boy, you know? And, and as a mother, it's like, you know, it's, Eight, eight months and some change into the process. It's like, yeah, the, whatever it is, it is. You guys understand. I can't do anything to change that now. And they're like, we're having a tournament and a party and it's going to be wonderful. And like, yeah, all right. So then, um, yeah, so lots of character building very quickly with Emma. And then we get to Viserys' dream, which Emma interprets very well, better than Viserys did. And so he says, I, you know, a, he dreamt of a boy born with an iron crown, Aegon's iron crown. And he says he placed, you know, his son on the iron throne to the tolling of bells and the dragons all roared as one. And so this is where we get back to the symbolism of the throne. Not only is it like a throne of swords, really should be seen as like a sacrificial altar. You know, um, in fact, let me share this artwork that Justin Sweet did of King Ares from the new calendar. It is very haunting. And uh, it makes the point very well. So I'll just put that right here. So this is Justin Sweet from the new calendar. And there you can see Viser or King, yeah, King Ares, sorry, Mad King Ares on the throne, haunted by his ghosts hearing whisperings that he doesn't understand, probably having dragon dreams, going crazy, Vari's driving him crazier, like, it's tragic all the way around. So when King Viserys talks about placing his son on the Iron Throne, think about, like, Abraham putting Isaac on the altar. Like, that's how I read that. And, of course, with the benefit of, you know, hindsight, knowing what happens, but... Yeah, we've been talking about the throne as an altar for a while in terms of symbolism. So that really comes through here. And Emma picks up on the idea of a baby born with a crown. She's like, God help me, you know. 
And of course, the baby yeah, is literally yeah. cut out of her womb with a with a steel knife. And so it, right. you can see the iron crown, throne of swords. This is all about knives and cutting and blood and sacrifice and altars. And yeah, so the symbolism, Viserys is missing it because he's so manifest destiny, my glorious son that's going to be born and the trumpets. Well, they, you know, it's the tolling of the bells. They toll the bells when a king dies too. So, you know, and the dragons roaring as one. Well, what are they roaring about? Maybe they're roaring because they're all yeah, about it, to eat each other. <laughs> yeah, it shows the way he he believes in his interpretation of these prof prophetic dreams so wholeheartedly. And I think we as readers of these stories know the prophecies aren't that easy to read and have many different interpretations. And uh, sometimes you can look at it with wishful thinking and come out with uh, what you want. I just want to call it, is, is someone, did someone, I'm a lizard baby, but so why don't you kill me? Did someone, did, uh, I'm a lizard someone, baby, someone so why don't you kill me? Oh, that's pretty good, Shad. It's good. It's good. Yeah, that was from the chat. That was from the chat. That was, oh. uh, I, uh, uh, where, where was it? Just went by. Oh man. Did dip, dip kiss something? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'll find it. I want to get the super <laughs> chat from, uh, Jenny. Oh, new YouTube feature. You can upvote the super chats. That's kind of cool. So, or like them, I guess. I don't know. Um, so is the weird a recon? Well, it's a change. Um, the we in King's Landing, the heart tree is an oak tree in the books in Ned's time. Uh, I, it is nowhere implied that there used to be a weirwood that was ripped up. Um, maybe they'll say that's what happened in the show, or by the end of the show, we'll see someone rip it up or something, or maybe Baylor, the Blessed, somebody's suggesting. But I think this is just a change they did for the show because they wanted a weirwood in King's Landing. I think that's all it is. It is different. You're correct. It is an oak tree in the books, though. <clears throat> so let's see here. Daniel Dibka, that's that's who it was. I found. Oh him. yeah, so thank yeah, you he's for... a good one. Many great comments. Good stuff. I love Beck too. So, um, yeah, there's there's Beck right there. I remember. My... Oh, nice. What can we do with Devil's haircut? There's got to be something we could do with Caraxes. <laughs> Okay, so then we get us uh, a bunch of Damon oh. action. I don't want to get this too hard because I just did a Damon video, but it's a whole exploration of executive power by force and what is justice and what is the job of the captain of the city watch. And, you know, Otto's trying to have it both ways, kind of. He's trying to make out what Damon did is like this wild, unbelievable thing that's inconsistent with the law. Not really. It's like that's kind of how medieval law works. <laughs> and Corliss points that right. out in the meeting, and so does Damon. It's like, hey, you want me to, you know, prosecute criminals? That's what we did. It's like, we, I mean, a, he's complaining about one two horse cart full of amputated limbs, one measly cart. There's a lot of crime in King's Landing. I think we could have filled two carts easy. We are. <laughs> Yeah, we, we all know jury trials weren't introduced until after the French Revolution in modern times. So the idea that that wasn't in line with normal prosecution at, in Westeros, I think, is was just another example of Otto trying to manipulate the situation. He wanted Damon far away because he knew that Damon was the only person who could challenge him to be closest to the king. And he needed to drive that wedge. Um, and I think that everyone else, even the king, eventually said, Man, maybe, maybe this would be a good thing, you know. Not that I agree with all that, but it reminded me of when, like, President Xi came to San Francisco and suddenly they cleared all of the street drug use out of the tenderloin and the homeless people out of a certain section of San Francisco. Um, it's not, it, it's not um, an, an expression of our highest ideals, but it's not the most shocking thing that happens in a society like that either. Something just mysteriously crashed. 
behind me, and I'm trying to figure out what it was. Just I heard it. I, I thought for sure. I thought for sure we would, could attribute that to a bird situation. No, I nothing moved. It was no. It was a ghost. I don't see anything. Broken. Well, yeah. So it, we got. Right. We, my 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 only thoughts on that scene are we we got um, Damon would make a hell of a football coach. He gives a real good pregame speech. He gets people fired up, and man, they go execute the play. Um, you know, just brutal Old Testament. You know, justice with the air quotes on it. Um, <laughs> and then the line, no, no, go on. You were saying something about my impunity. <laughs> yeah, Damon owns Otto consistently in all the one-on-one -on -one dialogue scenes. That's for sure. Yeah. But Otto, Otto swallows it. He eats a bunch of shit, but then gets, gets the better of him behind the scenes. So it's kind of how yeah. they joust. Um, let's see. Uh, Maynard James Plum, question from PayPal. How, does, how do Plum family reunions go? And will Brown Ben Plum retake the ancestral lands of the Plum family? <laughs> you know, we like to keep all that stuff in, in house. We don't like to talk about it outside of the family. So yeah, what do you guys come on? What do you expect? You expect Maynard Plum to just cough it all up? Tell you what his plans are? No, of course not. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see here. I had, a, I had a loose thought. What was it? Uh, Oh, yeah. I hope you don't have to maim half the city. And then Damon's like, time will tell. That was great. Time will tell. What a line. <laughs> time will tell. I died there. That was, it was good. So, um, also, all, Otto was, did a really snaky pivot. While he's in the middle of giving Damon a hard time for what he did as head of the city watch, once Damon kind of gets the better of him in that exchange, he's just like, and why are you ignoring your lady wife in the veil? And it's just like, what's that got to do with anything? And that's when Damon yeah. lowers to the level of like bringing up the death of Otto's wife, um, which is a more obviously offensive thing at first. But on the rewatch, you catch what Otto is doing, which is just changing the subject in the middle of the debate because he was losing the argument. So it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that was, uh, uh, and then I thought it was telling, you know, those two go at it. Damon sinks to the, you know, definitely gets the lowest blow in. And then the king says to Otto, you know how he makes a sport of, ch of chiding you. Why do you have to get, why do you have to set him up or what? You know what I mean? It's like chiding Otto for like, it's like, why do you let him punch you in the face like that? You know how he is, you know? And it's like, <laughs> okay, king. I'm sorry, your highness, you know, you're, I'm sorry, your grace, you know. It was an especially cowardly way to back up Damon. Like he could have backed up Damon, but that was kind of a like, yeah. just a lame way to do it. Yeah. So, because the thing, somebody like Damon, I talked a lot about Viserys and Damon and their relationship, but like Damon knows that Viserys is weak and everybody knows it. And everybody responds to that differently. So, like, part of the problem with Damon and Viserys is that Viserys hasn't earned Damon's respect. And that's probably why da Viserys doesn't keep Damon around all the time because he feels a little bit inferior around him. So there's there's, there's a point. lot to that dynamic. Yeah. yeah. All right. So Damon and Mysaria. The thing I noticed is that I didn't notice the first time is that Mysaria uh, offers to find Damon a maiden. I heard that, but with silver hair. So she's already picked yeah. up on the idea that he's hot for his niece. Um, and he's like, you want to role play that? Which reminds me of Jorah with the blonde sex worker uh, mm. in Volantis. You know, yeah. That, oh, uh, yeah. Pretending yeah. it was mm -hmm. Danny. Yeah. Uh huh. So. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Some some people are a little twisted. Um, but hey, look at the proliferation of AI porn. Um, it's we know that people are twisted. Hope that becomes illegal very soon. Any case, moving right along. 
Um, my Saria underlines the importance of Daemon status. You're Daemon Targaryen, you know, rider of Corexes, wielder of Dark Sister. Um, but you can see that Daemon is insecure and stressed out and unable to, you know, perform and all that stuff. So he's distracted. And then we get the tournament. I do think that. Oh, go ahead. That that scene is real quick. That that scene once again. That interaction between those two, I think again sets us up to see that the the sex workers of king's landing uh are held in low esteem and yet are some of the most astute wisest people that we see in any of the scenes they they have the most moral clarity and they play in a really important role being adjacent to power and and yet they're still held in this like low you know sort of uh, role uh, socially. Uh, That's a great point to what we saw. With drones. That's a great point, and not only that, but it's sort of uh, with our modern lens on the medieval world, Damon kind of gets points for not considering himself to be above people like that. Um, like you know, in the context of the world, everyone's like, oh, Damon, he hangs out in Flea Bottom, but like it's kind of cool that he's not stuck up and that he's keeps it real, you know? So like, yeah, that's part of his character. Yeah. And yeah, my Saria definitely, yeah. she is a mystery in the books and I'm curious to see what they do with her in season two and going forward, because there's definitely questions about where her real loyalties are. And, um, I did, this is not this episode, but later when Damon sort of jeopardizes my Saria by using her as a political football in the scene with the egg at Dragonstone, we can see that she responds poorly to that because she, you know, he's sort of playing casually with her safety when she takes that more seriously. But we'll talk about that, I guess, when we get to that one. But yeah, good point about my Saria. She is very perceptive. Yeah, so then we get to the tournament. Um, this is the most obvious thing that everyone remembers from the episode, so I don't want to belabor the point. But yeah, it's the tournament shows the pomp and grandeur and how violent it really all is, and it's all a commentary on what's going on with Emma. Um, there's some funny little bits in here. Viserys, his opening speech with some just trademark political BS... Never a finer <laughs> field of knights ever in the history. Like, yeah, it's pretty the sorry. Of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then, uh, oh yeah, not when, one had ever seen real battle. They're they're green. What are the the queens? The green is you know green is spring grass, and and you know, and he's like the finest the world has ever seen. You know, yeah, not quite. Yeah, Rainey's blows all that hot air away pretty quick later in the scene. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, um, funny, funny, thank you, Ian, gifting a David Lightbringer membership. Uh, yeah. Talking about Kristen Cole, you know, Allison and Rainier are both noticing him, you know, and who is that? And then she's, <laughs> Rainier says very casually, oh, I've never heard of House Cole. And it's just like, oh, man, if only, if only. <laughs> Uh, no spoilers, but he's going to continue to cause problems, that guy. Yeah, not, not the last we've heard of him. No. Yeah, if only. Uh, I've never heard of that. It's one of those moments. been like, oh, man, that's where the yeah. trouble started. Um, and so, yeah, it is kind of poetic that it is Damon and Kristen Cole fighting in the moment when Emma is dying. Because these two men are going to plunge Westeros into a lot of violence. They get a lot of the blame for accelerating and pouring gasoline on the most violent impulses here. So they are being very violent as Emma is dying. That is not an accident. Um, also want to point out uh, somebody you know, that's... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no. I was just going to say... Can you think of another example from from the Game of Thrones TV show series where they did such a good job of interlacing two things, like going back and forth between these two things, the childbirth and the tourney, just that, I mean, 
on the one hand, it could have been seen as heavy handed, but I thought they did it so well that it was like they were really beating home this point of, you know, she had foreshadowed it by saying that the, the, the birthing bed is our, you know, battlefield and then they're showing it and it just, I don't know. I just, I thought it was really well done um, for, you know, <laughs> If that scene probably would have left a, an impact anyway, but having it all tied up like that was, I just, it really, um, uh, yeah, I just, I thought it was well done. I was curious if you could think of another example where they had done anything similar. You're muted. Uh, similar in what sense? Just the structure, like structurally, the way they were bouncing back and forth, like visually kind of like to the point where these two divergent images were basically blended together in your in your mind, you know. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not a rewatcher of Game of Thrones, so I can't think of one. I don't know if anybody in the chat can, but it's definitely very good storytelling. Um, George yeah. does that kind of juxtaposition with flashback. He will have a character remember a different scene while they are experiencing another scene and they're cut in between. Um, that's how he does that. So, yeah, I always like it when, cause st storytelling techniques obviously are different, uh, for books or a visual medium, like a movie or a TV show. So I always like it when they use visual techniques that kind of remind you of the way that George writes. So I've pointed that out a couple times now I've noticed. So that's, that's what you get with Ryan being a big fan of George, working closely with George and really like understanding how he tells stories. Oh, they did it with, with Sam and the bowl of brown and the porridge and the poop. That's what it was. No, it was the porridge and the poop. He was cleaning the chamber pots and serving the porridge. So that is the, that is the Dave and Dan equivalent. That is perfect. That is chef's kiss. That is All right. Perfect. That is exactly it. That's perfect. That's perfect. Oh I need my gosh. I need that's a minute. Awesome. That's that's too much. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, chat. That that was that's great. Uh oh man. Yeah, Pomshka. Uh, Shout out to Pomshka in the chat. Okay. There was a comment, uh there was a super chat about Allison's dress too. I don't know if you uh yeah, it, it mirrors the King's Guard uh, in, a, in a couple times throughout the season. They're definitely using the dresses to do storytelling. Shout out to Costume Co., who, you know, analyzes all the clothing and stuff. Heidi from Costume Co. Uh, yes, they are definitely playing up her connections to the faith. And it, it reminds you of the Sansa, you know, a courtesy is a lady's armor. So literally her dress, her, her women's is her clothing armor. is armor, right. Yeah. And then uh, I just want to point out uh, somebody bets five dragons on Damon right before he tilts with Kristen. That's a big bet. Five golden dragons, even for a lord. So that just tells you how Damon is regarded and how meaningful of an upset it is, even though Kristen is a little dirty, but whatever. <clears throat> and then um, Damon is humiliating Otto as much as possible. He chooses Otto's son, Gwen. Beats him with a dirty trick and then asks for yeah. Allison's favor. Like, yeah. just rub. And Allison doesn't quite pick up on the insult, but Otto definitely does. Yeah, that there was a nice little bit of acting there from Otto, uh, you know, vibing the daughter. Like, even though there was nothing she could do, she couldn't turn down the prince. You know, she was going to give the favor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. uh, but he still looked kind of gave her this little vibe like how could you betray your house and she didn't really pick it up and you don't have to look so uh, happy about it yeah yeah you don't have to look so happy about it that's a great way to put it Otto I I don't I don't I'm sorry I don't know the actor's name but um, Reese Ifans the Otto character Riss Riss is that how you pronounce it I think it's yeah I don't know R H Y S okay. Um, you know, his character has some obvious corollaries to, to Tywin Lannister. Uh, but I have to say that that actor, um, I'm, I'm going to give him the award, whatever award uh, um, uh, we gave to, uh, to, to Mr. Gleason for playing Joffrey. He so embodies 
a terrible character. I, I don't think he'll ever be able to play a non-villain again. Like he just has so taken on the 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 sneaky, stab you in the back, smarmy, use my own daughter, use anything to get the power. I mean, he just I yeah. He does a it, thing like, where it would, it would affect how I think of go ahead. He does a mask dropping thing where most of the time he speaks very measured and composed, but like any true manipulator who's always being fake, every once in a while his speech gets a little too impassioned, and you can see the like the agenda peeking out. Um, so mm. yeah, masterfully yes. played. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Really great, really great actor. So the birthing scene, um, there's it's always tricky talking about stuff like this because it's like it's triggering just to think about it um it's people in the audience with kids and parents and you know uh, having kid children doesn't always i mean it's full of complications and every time is you know modern medicine has changed this a bit but it's still every time a woman gives birth it's a miracle when every like we just celebrated you know tim's new uh nephew it's like it is a miracle every time. So yeah, I wanted to approach this. I, I don't want to go over it over. It. You know, we, we all remember, uh, we remember this scene as well as we remember any scene from the show, but just to make a couple of points, um, it's very sad that Emma is spending her final moments on earth. So deliriously high from milk of the poppy that she basically almost doesn't know what's going on most of the time. It's very sad. Um, you know, she's saying things, I don't want to do this for series, but her speech is like slurred and it's just really heavy. Yeah, uh, they, they really, they hit an unfortunate place. Uh, they, they got her high enough on Milk of the Poppy so she can't really do anything about what's going on around her, but they managed to not get her so high that she really didn't know what was going on. Like she could still kind of, it was... It was really just horrific on, I mean, they, um, someone said the chat is frozen. I'm not sure if that's still the case. Oh uh, yeah. Um, hang on. I could fix that. I got to do uh, this. There we go. But yes, she's, she's, she's delirious, but she can tell that bad stuff is happening. And, and yes, as someone who was at the birth of my own child, even when it goes well, it's very stressful. And if anything doesn't go perfect, it's very stressful. And so for anyone who's been through that, um, that scene, uh, is a, it's a tough watch. You know? Right. It's and a, like anybody that's watch. been to the hospital with a family member that's in a dire, like that moment when the, yeah. they're giving you the bad news and they're telling you about the choice that you have, like, it's a very real moment that feels very modern uh, when the maesters are telling him about everything that's going on. So the, the thing about this scene that is the most troubling, besides all of it, <laughs> is the fact that Emma yeah. is not given a choice. It is Viserys making yeah. the choice. Okay, so it's like, it, it seems, from what they are trying to tell us about her medical condition and the limits of the medical ability of the maesters, she was going to die either way. So Viserys did not kill her in the sense that, like, she could have been saved, but he wanted the baby, so she died. Like, she was going to die either way. The choice was how. And obviously, like, taking the baby out with a, a C-section, uh, a primitive C-section is horrific, and that's what happened. So... The, the horror I'm saying is that like they didn't turn to Emma and give her the chance to make this sacrificial choice and say, yeah, do this to save my son. They asked Viserys, he made yeah. the decision. And once they, he made that decision, they treated her like an object. They yanked her down on the bed. She's like, what's going on? And then he's like making the incision yeah. like she wasn't even there. Yeah. Like she wasn't even there. Yeah. Um, and it's, it was interesting because, you know, we saw earlier the king and queen had a, a, a great relationship. 
Um, and it, it was tragic to me that, you know, I mean, just it, in a similar situation, obviously in a different world, in a different, you know, universe, you would think that two people that had this kind of relationship, the strong, long relationship that they had, that he would have gone to her and, and said, look, this is what they're saying. You've lost so much blood, you know, what, it, but, but that's just not the world that that's not the world that his mind lived in. Right. It, it is a stronger man in his position would have a stronger man in his position would have, but he, is the kind of guy that lets people around him tell him what to do. And so that's why he wanted the maester to tell him what to do. Yeah. And in the end, they did. They butchered her. That's exactly how it was supposed to look. Um, limited shots of the actual cutting, but like her body laying on, on the bed in the scene for the prolonged minute while oh. they could to talk about the baby and her corpse is just laying on the I mean... Yeah. And some just heavyweight physical acting from both her and Patty in that scene. Um, you know, you felt it. You felt like it was happening. You felt like it was, you know, again, just it, it was a horror show, but it was really, really well conveyed. Um, yeah. You and, can see uh, in her eyes that Vis that she understands that Viserys has betrayed her agency, essentially. And you, yeah, yes. it's. Um, that is, that is the, the, the most horrific emotional part of it. Yeah. Cause she didn't have the chance to make a noble sacrifice or anything like that. Um, so like, yeah. And of course it's like, well, she, she's so high at that point, you know, how could she make a decision or whatever? But it's like, they didn't give her the choice. So we're supposed to catch that. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Um, there is a there is a likeness between Damon and Viserys. Uh, you know, Damon's moment of glory is undercut at the last second. Same with Viserys. He thinks he's got this triumphant moment, and then it turns to defeat. Same with Damon in his fight. Um, yeah. So I think that's about that's about covers it. I just I just wanted to point out that. Um, do you, do you know this April May from the chat? Is, are you familiar with this name that floats no. by? Um, well, she just was saying that, and I've speak, I, I believe that when she says us, she means, you know, speaking from the perspective of a woman, most of us would choose to save the baby. Uh -huh. And, and that, you know, uh -huh. and I just, I just think that that's, I just want to put that in there because we're just two guys talking about this and, you know, and I have a child, but, I think that there is just something that for the mothers out there to watch that and to, to know that that's what she probably would have done given the choice she would, you know, like, you know, right. But they um, didn't even, they didn't even risk give her that chance, that dignity. Um, right. Yeah. That dignity, you know, the, to, to be a mother, to, to, to you know, to like, cause, you know, I mean, most parents, not just mothers, most parents instinct is to sacrifice for their child. You know, you're right. And, you're absolutely uh, right. That is that would have been her final act is the act of a mother putting herself aside for the good of her child. And that was taken from her. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good yeah. way of, of, of expressing it. Yeah, that sucks. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I just, I just, for for the moms out there, a special, a, a special ouch for that. That was a tough watch. That's all I can say about that. It's a tough. I, I might not. I need to go over here and talk to Garth for just a quick second after. Okay. That. <laughs> so I, need a, I need a moment. Everyone needs a moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and we'll we'll talk about how Lena made a different choice. Um, you know, when we get to that episode, I did think it was interesting how they, how they contrasted that. Yeah. And I, I think that's a valid sentiment. Just series, you know, mama should come first. There's no baby without the mama. Yeah. Um, I, I'm also generally like, yeah, what about humans alive now over humans? Not yet alive. Uh, 
these are fun choices to make. So, in yeah. any case, yeah, there's there's definitely um, we'll talk about the Lena thing in that episode. That's that's a moving scene as well and worth talking and the, about. The, just once again, the Maester is just doing their thing in this episode. Just just right there at all the critical times, do adding nothing of value. Just really kind of mucking things up. Thanks, Maesters. Thanks, guys. There's a shot of them reaching their hands through the blood to get the baby that's just... <laughs> Talk about visual of symbolism. Of course it's the like yeah. Those... yeah, of course it's the Maesters. So um, the funeral so scene, like I said, there is this double reveal of first we see Emma's corpse and then... We see the baby, um, so we see it's all—it's all been for nothing. Um, we see Rhaenyra. She says, "I will never be a son." And Damon's like, "Oh, your father's going to need you," and she's like, "I'll never be a son." So you know, we've already talked about Rhaenyra's feelings about that, but just emphasized here. And she says, "I wonder if my father found happiness for those few hours that Balin was alive." So she's sort of—you can see she holds her father responsible for putting Emma through so many pregnancies in his quest to have a son. And that's, she's the perfect person to sort of indict him on that, if yeah. you will. So then we go to the small council meeting and also um, lighter note, uh, the Valerian funeral customs are present here. They have the dragons light the pyres. That's noted many times in fire and blood. That's how it's done. So it's kind of cool. Another um, another one of those moments that we've we've heard about, you know, even going back to in in Game of Thrones that you know they mentioned something. I think uh, at some point, uh, they I think it's mentioned that that's how they used to do their their funerals. Yeah, um, sometimes it's noted which dragon lights a pyre. So it's um I think uh, Jaehaerys is Vermithor lights the pyre for. Aegon, is it? Um, I forget. But on some occasions, sorry guys, on some occasions it is noted which dragon uh, lighted which pyre. Also, another cool bit of uh, Targaryen funeral trivia. When Aegon the Conqueror died, his sword Blackfire was put on the pyre. And of course it did not burn, being Valyrian steel, but it did come out a darker shade of grey afterwards so it is written <clears throat> anyway um so then we go to another small council meeting and like i said this is almost okay so this is foreshadowing of the coup that that team green will pull at the end of the season Otto is calling a meeting to discuss a succession crisis like i said that no one else think exists so just like when everybody is like, okay, so Viserys is dead, let's tell Rhaenyra and make plans for the coronation. And he's like, oh, but we got to decide the matter of the succession. And pe other oh, people yeah. in the room are like, the what way, succession? What are you talking about? And he's like, well. The writing was great. They all walk into the room and the king says, where's my daughter? And Otto is like, yes, that's right. We need to talk about this very important thing. And everybody's kind of like, what? What are you doing? And he's just like, goes right into it. You know, and it's just like, nobody was saying anything about anything. Dude, we were talking about where's the cupbearer? And you're just like, I know, we need to talk about this right now. And, and like, then you can see okay, how the maester Otto. and Otto are working one, two, one, two. He's, as soon yeah. as Otto stops talking, the maester jumps in to underline his point. When Otto says something that makes Viserys go, huh? Then the maesters on the other side going, no, 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 no. So it's yeah. the managing of the series is picking up in intensity. Um, and there are some real mask slip moments here. Um, when they start talking about Damon, um, you know, uh, yes. Melos is like, well, if Damon were to remain the unquestioned heir. So you can see like nobody else thought there was a succession crisis except for Otto. But then Melos is right there to be like, yeah, we can't leave Damon the heir. So he's on the same page. And um, yeah, what is it? it would destabilize the realm. And Corliss says, the realm or this council? Yes, right. That was a great line. That yeah. was that was him calling the bullshit, but they just go, keep right going. <laughs> and <know>. um, <laughs> they talk about Otto's series of demotions of Damon. 
where it's like you said he was this so i made him that then you said he was that so that i made him that that was your solution and then he's like the truth is he shouldn't be anywhere near power and it's like ah that's what you've really been saying the whole time then Otto gives away the game and he says it is the duty of the council to protect the king and the realm from Damon. So we see that Otto has this mindset where it's like, oh, well, my duty is to contradict the king if I think it's better for the realm. So this is right. an upjumped hand for sure, we can see. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's lost respect for the king at this point and thinks that he knows better and so he's definitely comfortable injecting his own judgment in place of the king's judgment um, where they where they uh, conflict with each other. So, yeah, that's. Um, and he's been subtly uh, planting the seeds and now he's trying to make this push. He's hoping that he's built up enough uh, suspicion of Damon in Viserys's mind to now push him over the edge. But Viserys is not quite there. And so he's like, you know, he will have a place at my yeah. court. And it's not until later after the air for the day insult that Viserys finally gives in to Otto's pushing. Um, Jenny says, interesting parallel between Emma and Viserys' intimacy in the bath scene and Danny and Viserys right before her bath and his abuse. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I didn't either. That's a great, that's a great echo. That's a great echo. And probably intentional because they're doing a lot of that echoing of like da Daenerys's you know, yeah. peak, you know, peak moments, you know, her most notable moments. That's so right. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So like, oh, and you know, that's really potent, Jenny, because even though the scene with Viserys is very tender, there is an abusive layer to that as well. It's just a lot less obvious. I mean, it's not the same. I'm not saying they're the same Viserys by any means. Like Viserys the second, Danny's yeah. brother. Actually, he's not the second. He would have been Viserys the third. Um, he is obviously a terrible, terrible person. King Viserys gets a lot of blame and criticism, but is means well. He's not a bad person. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, interesting parallel. Well pointed out, Jen uh, Jenny. So. Yeah. Um, and then there's uh, so oh. real quick, April May as a targ sword uh, question. So I, this is my wheelhouse. Okay. We we do not know. We do not know when any Valerian steel swords were made. Really, we know that uh, Ned's or the House Stark's ice is 400 years old from Valeria, according to Cat. So that gives us a little bit of a guess as to when Valerian steel was entering the Seven Kingdoms. I have extrapolated that Dragonstone, which was settled by Valyria a hundred years prior to the Targaryens moving there, Dragonstone was likely the trading outpost from which the Valyrians sold Valyrian steel to Westeros. Because we know that uh, Westeros has been buying up Valyrian steel. A lot of people have it in Westeros. They love it. It is like what you want if you're a lord in, in Westeros, Valyrian steel. There's like... I think I think somewhere it said there's over 200 Valerian swords, um, you know, running around. There's only like 14 or so named, but we do not actually know when the Valerians started making Valerian steel. We have no idea how there's our 5,000 year old empire. We don't know, so we don't know when Blackfire or Dark Sister were forged. We can assume that they were forged in Valeria and brought you know, the Targaryens would have brought them with them to Dragonstone when they moved to Dragonstone. But yeah, we have no idea. Um, now, what we do know is that uh, the secret of Valerian steel, maybe this is maybe what you're asking about, is lost after the doom. The Targaryens do not make new Valerian steel after Valeria falls. So one can infer that they did not possess the secret of making Valerian steel. And if you think about the Valerian freehold, they're not ruled by one monarch. They have these 40 ruling families that jockey for power in some sort of Senate-like institution, like a Senate without a president. So logic dictates that probably there was a division of power, and it tells us the Targaryen dragons were bred for war, quote-unquote. So 
I've speculated maybe one great house, like House Targaryen, has war dragons. Somebody else has they, Valerian steel making. Somebody else is churning out glass candles. Another house is contributing the mages that control the fires. And that way the power is spread out. It would have to be for all these families to keep each other in check. Nobody could monopolize all of the Valerian arts or else they'd be emperor. So it makes sense that a lot of stuff was lost when the Targaryens moved to Dragonstone and Valeria fell. Valerian steel making is lost. Now... <clears throat> yeah, ice was purchased by the Starks essentially right before the Doom. Yeah, that's kind of what we are, uh, what the timing is on that. Now, some people can rework Valerian steel, but they cannot produce more Valerian steel. Cohoric smiths, such as Tobo Mott in King's Landing, knows how to rework Valerian steel. So when we look about the maesters, they have the links of Valerian steel in their maester chains, if, if people study the magic. Lewin has a Valerian link. So it could be that they have a cohort smith at the Citadel to forge links from a lump of steel or something. It could be that they bought a bunch of links from Valeria. It could be that they have to open the links to add them to the chain. But I also pointed out that you, it'd be more easy to open the links adjoining the Valerian link instead of opening the Valerian link to add it to a chain but there's your deep dive on valerian steel since you asked and since i love valerian steel and valerian stuff in general <coughs> all right so um and that is something that they highlight you know with uh Rhaenyra's locket and dark sister and all that so there you go. it's relevant and where are we uh oh the small council meeting so it ends with Viserys saying that he won't suffer crows to feast on the corpses of Emma and Balin. So shout out a Feast for Crows book title. Very cool. And uh, that's pretty much that. Yeah, I thought, I thought that was a good line. I also thought that the king saying, I will not be made to choose between, you know, talking about his brother, um, that's where that's where Otto stepped over a line because the, he had just been forced to make this other choice, and and he was like they were pushing him and pushing him, and then when they were like you have to make this choice, like I'm not gonna make I he said I will not be made to choose, and he stormed off, you know, um, having gone through what he just went through. Hey, April, I'm not sure he wasn't why you ready, but just to put a button in the Valerian Steel thing. Sorry. Um... No, there's nothing that implies that uh, Blackfire and Dark Sister were made after the Doom. That is incorrect. I'm not just I'm just not sure where you got that idea. That is not that is not correct. Um, and there is no new Valerian steel made after the Doom. I'm very sure about that. Uh, sorry, but uh, going back, um, uh, let's see, uh, Jenny. And then uh, we got. Uh, oh uh, no, Cheryl was asking about Longclaw. Some people have wondered if Longclaw is Blackfire. No. House Mormon has had Longclaw for a while. Wouldn't be Blackfire. Also, Illyrio has Blackfire. Blackfire disappeared with the Blackfires when they went to Essos. Illyrio sent it to Fagon in one of those chests. It's a very strong theory. I don't want to go into it now, but Blackfire will appear. It will be in Fagon's possession. And I will also tell you that I would guess that Aegon's prophecy is inscribed on there in secret runes, just like it is on the knife in the show. Because George Cleo is copying from Elric of Melnibene, and his swords have runes on them. Hang on, I have a bird situation. Come here. The drawer was open. She got a little... This is getting nesty. The birds are your throat. I saw, I saw you got a little nip from the throne there. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're my Iron Throne. Yes. You can't sit comfortably. Iron throne. No. <laughs> Heavy is the head that wears so the bird. We, we, uh, we cut to Otto telling, telling the maester, send a raven to Old Town right away. You know, and then he goes and, and talks to us. And it's like he... He has to put his play. He, he went and he, I, I need to go and I need to create a secession crisis. And then I need to put, I need to send a raven and I need to send my daughter, right? He's like, he's like, 
auto to do list for the day, you know, and he just He's just uh, just checking it off the yeah, to do list, just, yeah. just just crushing the list, just really slaying it. Burke Auto, we should all be so productive. Um, so the question about Long Claw is how does how does Mormont how can they afford a Valerian steel sword? Um, I'm not sure. That's just something George hasn't fleshed out, but you know, they, they won a battle against somebody and seized a bunch of gold and then went and bought a sword, you know, like there's, it's some, if George needs to invent an answer, it'll be something like that. I don't think there's anything suspicious about Longclaw. Um, it's already doing a lot by, see, it's a bear sword that becomes a wolf sword. So George is, why are you smiling? Are you wondering how oh, long? Because I just, no, no, I love this. This is great. This is great. This is all good stuff. So <laughs> this is about the Ulf Hednar and the Berserkir. These are the two kinds of Norse warriors, the bear warriors and the wolf warriors. George is using that a lot with the skin changers, with John and the Mormonts. So the idea of John and Mormont being Lord Commander one after another and having the sword go from bear sword to wolf sword um yeah that's all norse mythology and there's there's a lot of great symbolism with long claw as it is but it is not secretly black fire i do not think do you think aegon's prophecy is also on dark sister um it would be cool if it was continued long sentence from one blade yeah. to the other that would be cool it's either on it's either on the sword or on the inside of aegon's crown that's the other cool place it could be. And Aegon's crown is another artifact that is lost that is likely to emerge again. So, yeah. Anyway. So, yes, the Alicent and Otto scene, as we said, this is deepening Otto's villainy here. It is very creepy. And the lines are just... There's long pauses between the lines that are just pregnant as hell. I thought you might go to him, offer him comfort in his chambers. And it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then she's like, I wouldn't know right. what to say. And like, she's not saying like, oh, I wouldn't know how to start a conversation with him. She's like, you want me to seduce the king? How am I supposed to do that? Yeah. And then he says, uh, you might wear one of your mother's dresses. And at the beginning of the conversation, he says, I found myself thinking of your own mother today who died tragically, possibly giving birth. I can't remember or not. But um, Emma's death is reminding them of the death of Allison's mother and Otto's wife. I'm sorry. They don't say her name. We don't know her name, I don't think. Um, but then he uses that to manipulate Allison. And yeah. like, it's just so sick the way that Otto is using that emotion. Like, I need to put Cleo back in the room. Can you comment on that for 30 seconds while I disappear? And I'll be right back. I probably can't. I'm just, I'm probably just going to comment again on what a fantastic job this actor is doing with the Otto character and how I, I really, I mean, this is something that I think left an impact on any viewer that watched this this scene, this this scene with the father and a daughter subverting every natural impulse that a father and has, you know, with his daughter and really revealing his character and doing it in a way that made me loathe this character so deeply. I, I just I, I credit to the actor for the job that he's doing with Otto. It's 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 uh, it's it's an amazing, amazing work making me hate this guy this much. Um, so quickly. Uh, so yeah, it was, and then they smash cut to the brothel, right? It, just commenting on like, here's one way that it's done. And here's another way that it's done. Oh, it's I didn't like, even think about <laughs> that. Yeah. Oh. Um, the structure, the, the, the editing of this show is really great. You know, it, um, they really, they really did, did a lot. Uh, yeah. And then gosh. we get the, the, you know, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I just, yeah, here's one way that 
women are used and here's another way that women are yeah it's it's right there um yeah then yeah. we've got um oh there is something to notice so Otto goes right from the meeting as you pointed out where he's saying well let's move Damon aside and make Rhaenyra the heir and an hour later he's planning on marrying Alicent to Viserys or he's already was planning that but you can see that he's enacting the plan as soon as Emma dies so it's like he never intended Rhaenyra to, to be queen he only wanted to no. put her in the position because she would be weaker as <laughs> just because she's not a man in her position. Right. And it would be easier for him to replace her later, which he's already planning to right. do with her best friend. Like, yeah. <laughs> the more we think yep. about Otto, the worse it gets. <laughs> oh, he's, he's a piece of work, man. My guy is a, he's a, he's really something. Um, and then we get a we get a very you know well auto auto tattles on uh, Damon and then... oh well hold on let's I think we're skipping past the scene with Allison to Miserys. Oh, we already said it, but I guess I just want to repeat okay. myself. Allison, the character, is kind of awesome here. She shows up. She's very nervous, as you pointed out. The acting, she can barely get the words out. I brought a, a book. You know, it's very little, little clipped bird speech. She's. And the way that Viserys greets her, yes, Allison, what is it? He's talking to her like one of his daughter's friends that knocked on the door, like, you know, is Rhaenyra here? He's like, no, she's not, you know. But then she's like, oh, right. I thought I might right. comfort you. And he's like, okay. And they're sitting far apart. And it's just like, but then I notice something. The roles shift. Allison becomes an embodiment of the mother in the sort of faith of the seven archetypal sense, just like Sansa mothering Sandor unexpectedly in the one scene, we see Viserys like a hurt little boy playing with his toys as a way of outletting his grief. And Alicent is there comforting him. And she does a very empathetic thing. And she says, you know, when my mother died, all everyone said was this, but I just wanted somebody to say, you know, I'm sorry. And, and like all of a sudden she put yeah. herself in the same position as Viserys and you could tell that landed. And all of a sudden she became an adult and a real person in the eyes of Viserys. Well, yeah. And, and I think you're spot on with that, that, that he saw her as different. Interesting. If I could tie this back to something we were talking about earlier with this character, so she walks in, she's wearing her mom's dress, she's holding a book. She is in the king's chambers. She is nervous. She does not know what to expect. But when she gets in that room, her ability to read people and her ability to read people's emotions serves her. And within a minute of being in that room, she realizes what he needs to hear and tells him exactly what he needs to hear. And by the end of it, she, all of the tension has gone from her voice because she's, she's solved the emotional sort of puzzle that's been put in front of her. And she's like, she can breathe again. She can, she can act. She's like, you know, and she's like, oh, he's, this is, yes, he's the king, but this is just a, a hurt terrified old man that just wants somebody to say tough day huh you know and so very empathetic dude and wise beyond her years and um you know but again it's i think it's a product of her abusive upbringing that i was about to tools. say it's it's delicious how we can sit here if we want we can say that this is altruistic allison is empathizing with viserys She's overcoming her nervousness and the crappy motives that have been put in her head by Otto, and she's doing a very human thing. Or maybe she's doing exactly what Otto asked her to do and building a bridge with Viserys in a calculating way. It's hard to say. We can't really know. 
Maybe it's a little bit of both. Oh, I would wonder <laughs> if, if we had a chapter that was a point of view chapter from her point of view in that moment, would we know? Would a teenager know what all of your motivations are in any given moment that was so fraught as that, a moment so fraught with emotion as that? I think it would be a soup of things going on in her own head. You know, I mean, I, I'm i sure that all of that is somewhere on, an, on a subconscious emotional level. Her, her father has put the, a lot into her, put a lot on her and now is using her like a piece on a chessboard. So yes, she was human in that moment, but somewhere in there was her father's desire. Yep. Um, I was, I'm reading the mm. chat here and people are observing, you know, Otto has basically no redeemable qualities. And that's, that's true. Um, this is one of those talking points that becomes too flattened. Uh, George likes gray characters. He does. Um, like we said before, most evil deeds are done by people, not monsters. They're people that do horrible things. People are capable of doing horrible things. We need to understand that. Um, yeah. Ramsey Bolton exists. The Mountain right. exists. Tywin right. Lannister exists. That's These right. people don't have redeemable... Those people exist in the real world. People are like that. That's right. Um, what rare. George does rare, is help... Yeah. Sorry, if I just finish real quick, I'll get back to you. It just George makes us think about how people get like that. That's where the subtlety comes in. It's not that they are that you can defend it really, but it's just that like you you think about their motivations, they're realistic. So Otto, he's he's important. His motivations are important. He is the distillation of what all the other high lords are kind of doing, but they're like, ooh, I don't want to do it. It's kind of icky. But they're all playing the Game of Thrones. They're all using their children as pawns. Otto is just embraces it. He's like, this is what we're doing. It's an evil game that we play, but I think you have the talent to win. Okay? He is, he's fully on board with this is the Game of Thrones. It's mucky and dirty, and that's what we're doing. Um, other people are trying to put the veneer on it and make it look nice. So... It's important to have that character that just fully embraces the Machiavellianness of it, if you can even call him that. Um, and that's, you know, so I think when you compare Otto to like Corliss and Rainey's is when it really becomes ch chilling because you realize there is some Otto in all of these other High Lords too, right? Yeah. I, I was thinking about the shot of the tourney where they show the stands and they sort of sweep in and you're seeing the stands and all the people in the stands and then the box the, where the royalty is, right? All of those people in the stands are lords. Those are all, all those people that could afford to be in the stands at that tournament. You know, hmm. all this, those every hmm. one of those people is some house that would trade most of them would trade positions with Otto to have that seat next to the throne. They would give two of their kids. They would get, you know what I mean? Like it's so, yeah, it's Otto. Otto is Otto and he is a special a, a case and he has embraced the evil in a way that others maybe don't, but yeah, you're right. They all have a little bit of Otto in them. Yeah, and sorry guys, if there's any stream jitteriness, there is definitely some storm happening. You can reduce your, um, yeah, the resolution down a little bit uh, to prioritize the audio, but um, you can also catch it on the rewatch Oops. if it is too, too glitchy for you. But we're we're weathering the storm here. We're doing our best, and we're also almost finished. So we are basically two scenes left. Yeah, the air for the day scene, uh, which kind of sets up the following scene. And I talked about this in the Damon video a bunch. Otto's quick to tattle. He didn't need to go and tell him what Damon said in the brothel. But of course, this was like a cherry, you know, for Otto. He's been trying to undermine Damon. Yeah. And Damon gave him this ammunition to work with. And he was going to fire that baby first thing, you know, first chance he gets. So. That's that. And uh, then, you know, Damon's getting called out for it in the throne room. 
And I did notice something here. Um, Viserys is indicting him saying, oh, instead of being with Rhaenyra or at my side, you're with your horse on your lick spittles. Um, but then later in the next scene, when he calls Rhaenyra in front of Balerion's skull to tell her about the prophecy knife and make her the heir, Rhaenyra says, you haven't spoken to me since Emma's death. So it's like he's giving Damon a hard time, but he hasn't been with his daughter either. It's a great catch. Yeah, no, it's a great catch. Yeah. The line delivery, the whores and lick spittles, man, the line delivery. He just hammers that line. It's, it's so good. Ah, yeah, Patty, Patty ate. Patty ate in that scene for sure. Yeah. It was a yeah. lot of fun to meet him. I just, by the way, he was at the con in L.A. last year or two years ago. And I'd say he was the highlight of the whole con. Like everywhere he went, the energy was there. He really felt like the king. Big smile, big personality. He signed everything that people had. He went the extra mile. He gave very interesting interviews. And like, yeah, he just, he was, um, he's a cool dude. And he also, he's a front man of a rock band. So like charismatic dude. Um, but yeah, he was a great King Viserys. Good stuff. The world will not see his like again. So <laughs> well King said. Viserys, that is. Patty Considine as well. King Viserys is not. He fell apart. So, yeah, um, we'll get to that. Now, again, in the Damon video, I hit this, but just to summarize, you know, this was really Damon laying it out. You never, you've never kept me by your side. You've always sent me away. So he's like, why would I think that you want me at your side? You never want me at your side. And this is the root of it all. I I mentioned that in the books, Viserys marsh or Damon marshals a small army of cell swords to back up Viserys' claim at the Great Council when Damon is only 20 or so. So Damon's been riding for Viserys since the beginning. And uh, he was right about Otto. And, and Viserys made the wrong choice. You know, he chose Otto over Damon. That was the wrong choice. And he cuts his hand as he makes the choice. So I don't really have to explain that to you. That's where the trouble starts. And, you know, I said Viserys cuts yeah. his hand along to some really sick Ramin strings, very tense strings. And you know that the happiness yeah. is gone f from this show. <laughs> yeah. It is. No, the, uh, when he sends again, Damon the, the out, there's a final different. note to the music. It's just like, oh, you've just done it. You know? Yeah. Spectacular soundtrack work again. Um, and yeah, Damon, he, he lays it right out. He says, you know, I, I'm family. I've got your best interest at heart and he doesn't. And at that point, you know, once someone poisons a relationship, it's, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to see clearly. And, uh, and at that point he can't see his brother clearly. And, uh, I did think that Damon's excuse of, well, we all mourn in our own ways was a little, a little thin. It's a little thin. Yes, it was. He did a good job to not to just really sort of move past that to what he was really upset about. Because, yeah, that was not yeah. super defensible. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that wasn't a good look. You're right. Was hoping you weren't going to hear about that. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway. One thing I did notice. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, how about that? Uh, you want to go dragon riding or anything? Um, um, so <laughs> I did notice that Damon wants to protect Viserys from himself. And Otto wants mm -hmm. to protect He's Viserys up. from Damon. And that sort of encompass, uh, um, encompasses the different motivations there. Yeah. yeah. So then we get the final skillful scene cutting, which is Rhaenyra. Yes. And uh, Viserys, they're actually, first we get the scene cutting of them talking in front of Balerion's skull and the ceremony where she's being made queen. Um, her preparations, yeah. getting dressed is also layered in. And then we start to get Damon mounting Caraxes and leaving King's Landing layered in. So the Damon part yeah. is interesting because there's a sad note to it because he's leaving King's Landing. His family has rejected him. But he's sure happy to be on Caraxes again, isn't he? And he's showing Mysaria the dragon. 
And it just reminds you that Damon has this indomitable spirit. He doesn't sulk. Like, he's like, fine, you're sending me away? Well, I'll make the best of that and go do something cool then, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he is. He's kind of like Damon being Damon. You know, he that's what he does. Um, and and he'll just keep keep moving forward, you know, self-motivated and, and being himself. Uh, that last sound of the dragon at the very end, the, the screen goes black and you just get the, 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 the sound of the dragon screaming. It's very yeah. powerful. Um, uh, did you pick up on anything in the, in the knee bending ceremony other than obviously we got to meet an old, you know, one of the Rickens, um, uh, well, there was some intentional overlay. Like, they showed us the Stark kneeling when they talked about the threat from the North. Um, when the when Hobart Hightower gave his oath, they gave the longest version of the oath, whereas I will not betray and I will defend her claim. Like, really spelling out that the Hightowers are saying something that they are not meaning to do. Right in that moment, Hobart Hightower has already had that raven from Otto. They're already planning with Alicent. They never intend to honor this oath. Um, so we're the lingering on Hobart's words and swearing is supposed to. We're supposed to remember that raven to Old Town and know that like uh -huh. this man is false, you know, and that some That's of these it. high lords in this room swearing to Rhaenyra are lying right as they say it. That's, I'm glad you pointed that out because I did notice they were giving that so much weight, but I didn't make that connection. But I, I, when you said it, that really rings true, that they're, they're showing you clearly like, no. And, and so obviously some of the others are, are again, the same. What, uh, was there a super chat there? That I, did you... uh, oh, thank you. Let's see. I see nothing wrong with Damon trying to get Rhaenyra. Better to get them young. Oh, okay. This is... Uh... Okay. It's the same troll that comes back with different names. And it's like, they always start off sounding pleasant. And then you... It's much like a George Martin horror passage. It gets worse and worse as it goes until you realize you're being trolled by somebody with like a super warped worldview that's saying the most grotesque stuff as possible behind an anonymous shield and, you know, it's the internet so got it so that was a ten dollar donation to planned parenthood that we're yes doing? exactly yes that's awesome <laughs> we appreciate your clicks and your views and your ten dollars will go to good use and try to make the world a better place so do we we've got i think that's it the, the sound at the end i think we made it all the way through the episode yeah, there's so there's a couple notes on the last scene that I had. Um, let's see. Uh, the interesting thing, we've talked about this before, but it's so interesting that Viserys admits to being so uncomfortable with the dragons to where he says, not only is the idea that we control them an illusion, they're a power men should never have trifled with. One that brought Valeria its yeah. doom. And if we don't mind our histories, it will do the same to us. A Targaryen must understand this to be king or queen. So... It's this whole resting uneasy on the Iron Throne thing. It's like our claim to power rests on the fact that we control monsters, which would be happy to eat us. So don't forget that. Um, it's super ominous. And I always point out that Viserys rode Balerion one time when Balerion was very old and never again. Balerion died. Viserys never claimed another dragon. He easily could have and did not. So... Yeah, it's clear that he's, you know, not very comfortable with the dragons. And obviously this is contrasted with Damon, who is loves Caraxes and is petting him. And in the same moments that we're seeing Viserys say that we, we don't control the dragons, you know, I'm not comfortable with the dragons. Mm -hmm. And Damon's very comfortable and does have a manner of control over Caraxes. They have a very tight relationship of all the <laughs> dragons and riders. <clears throat> um, 
Oh, okay. We're going back into long claw theory. Um, this is a very generous circle <laughs> chat, so I will have to stop and think about this for a second, but let me finish my train of thought. Um, so Viserys compares the Iron Throne to the dragon saddle and says it's more dangerous of a seat. And this is what I was saying at the beginning of the episode where Allison is in the ca- uh, carriage and Rhaenyra is on the dragon. And the dragon is the more dangerous but empowering seat. Well, the Iron Throne is the most powerful and the most dangerous seat, both. Um, so, And then lastly, there's a direct call out to Lyanna and the Tower of Joy. When he says, promise me, Rhaenyra, promise me. It's promise me, Ned, uh, promise me. So, and of course, yeah. the promise is about the, the prophecy of ice and fire, which will be fulfilled in John at the Tower of Joy. Partially fulfilled in John. Yeah. So, to go back to the super chat. Yeah. There's, if there's a Mormont at Summer Hall... That'll be the clue that Blackfire is Longclaw. I think Blood Raven hid the sword after his duel with Bitter Steel, but he'll give it secretly to Aegon before going to the wall, and it'll be at Summer Hall. Um, I mean, that would be cool if this if there is an artifact hidden at Summer Hall. That would be interesting. Oh, so you're saying if there's a Mormont at Summer Hall, right? That's where the handoff would be. Um, I I don't remember what the lines are about it being lost with the Black Fires. You'd have to read the specific line and see if it sounds like something that was written to have intentional like wiggle room or suspicion about it or not. Um, but there are a lot of clues that Blackfire is in one of the chests that Illyrio has sent to Fagon, and I can't remember what those clues are off the top of my head, uh, but it is a theory that you can find. And yeah, I just, I don't have a strong, I mean, I haven't investigated this enough to give a strong ruling on it, but my instinct is that Longclaw is not Blackfire. But obviously there's a whole developed theory here that I'm not aware of, so I don't want to throw water on the fire of the theory without understanding it fully. I am skeptical. And what would be the point um, to put Longclaw in John's hands? Because the thing is, or to put Blackfire in John's hands, because Dark Sister, which is a Targaryen ancestral sword, George has clarified that Blood Raven did take that to the wall. So Dark Sister is in Blood Raven's cave, almost certainly. So we have a Targaryen ancestral sword in the north, that Bran and Mira will be bringing back to Winterfell or the Wall that Jon could have his hands on as he learns that he's a Targaryen. So if there needs to be a Targaryen sword for Jon to have, there's already one there. So I don't think um, it makes a whole lot of sense for Longclaw to be Blackfire. And it makes more sense for Fagon to have Blackfire because Fagon is being trumped up as this fake Targaryen. And Danny's got the dragons, which are like the seal of authenticity. So it makes sense if Fagon has like the crown and the sword and the trappings. So I'm pretty attached to that being how it goes. But um, I see what you're saying about Summerhall and the Mormonts. And uh, we're supposed to find out about yeah. Summerhall in the seventh Duncan Egg book. So we'll see if George gets there. <laughs> Oh, if we could be so fortunate. That was a good hearty laugh, Maynard James Plum. <laughs> well, I do. I love the Dunkin' Egg books. You you know how I feel about that. I think that um, I, I would, I think he should do a ton of them. I think there's a whole episodic, they could do a five-year TV show with, with uh, episodes. I've, I've got it all mapped out in my head. I love Dunkin' Egg. One of my favorites. Yeah, so John... John is one where you can match him with a lot of swords, okay? I make the case that he's destined to wield Dawn. John is one half of Azor High Reborn, along with Danny. Danny's Lightbringer is her dragons. John dreams of wielding a flaming sword. In the, so- in the dream, it's Longclaw, because that's his sword. But there's a lot of foreshadowing that the last hero, who was a Stark, originally carried Dawn, and that John will carry Dawn as well. 
if Dawn is Lightbringer, then John is going to be the one to carry it. Otherwise, it's just going to stay in Starfall and never come out to play. If it comes out to play, John's going to get it. Um, also, John constantly thinks about Ice, his father's sword. So if he got his hands on Oathkeeper or Widow's Whale, that would be poetically fulfilling. Um, if he just wielded Longclaw, yeah. that would be meaningful because Longclaw has accrued a lot of its own meaning to John. And if he wielded Dark Sister, that would make sense because he's a Targaryen and that would be him stepping into his Targaryen heritage. So take your pick. Take your pick. Which sword will John wield? Answer in the chat. My money is on Dawn, but any of them could work. Don, Don My Juan. money is on more, more than one. More than one. I think he's going to do more than one at some point. Double wielding. He's going to double he needs fit. four arms for yeah. all his swords. Yeah. Well. So, yeah. So, that is it. That'll do it. That'll wrap up our stream. Nice, cozy two hours and six minutes, minus the interlude from hell, uh, from the storm god. That's where it came from. So... Thank you all, folks, and I will see you um, again soon. Let's see what we'll be doing. Uh, subscribe to my channel, because next week is the stream is not going to be at the normal time. Next week is Super Bowl Sunday. So we're either going to do this on Saturday or Sunday earlier in the day. And Maynard Plum, I think we were leaning Saturday, weren't we? We were leaning that way, yeah. Um. And if I do it on Saturday, I'll probably just do it at the same, you know, 3 p.m. Pacific time as I always do my streams. But maybe we'll do it a little earlier. Uh, subscribe to the channel. you never miss a notification. So there you go. And no, Maynard James Plum does not have a channel. His channel is this channel because he manages me and my. That's right. Business. So. There you That's go. That's right. Everyone say thank you to Maynard Plum for keeping me focused and on the rails like i have been <laughs> another hearty laugh all right <laughs> focused <on. laughs> and uh like i said i think i told uh. this i mentioned this in the chat during the interlude but my next video will be a green man video secret origins of the green men part four it's about the green weirwood trees that we now know existed on the isle of faces because of the Rhaegar and Lyanna art from the calendar. It's a major yeah. thing about the Weirwoods having a different original form, something we speculated about for years. And uh, so, yeah, I've got a killer Green Man video coming. If you want to celebrate, I've with seen some of them, Garth, Yeah. If you want to, hey, if you want to celebrate with a Praise Garth T-shirt, the link is below, and you can now get a Reading Rhaegar T-shirt as well. Let me show the Rhaegar shirt off again I've, in case anybody missed that. I've seen some early sketches on the upcoming video. There's some cool ideas. The script is really strong. This is going to be a good one. There's some killer art. Uh, yeah, it should, be, it should be a really cool one. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, Dave. This was fun. Last minute, you know, but I think, I think it went well, so... Yeah, I appreciate you filling in for old Timmy, Uncle Tim. Yeah, Uncle so. Tim. Congratulations, Tim. Safe travels. That's that's nice looking. Lavender. And classic black. So there you go. Get yourself a Reading Rhaegar t-shirt or Praise <laughs> Garth shirt or a David Lightbringer shirt if you want to rep the David Lightbringer. So we appreciate you guys, and uh, I'll see you next week. Peace out.